Okay, this is live now. So, assalamu alaikum. This is uh, the evidence-based parenting session that we've been looking forward to with Dr. Leonard Sachs. He's going to be presenting to us um, what is the okay. best. Okay, this is live now. So, assalamu alaikum. This is. Uh, so he's going to be presenting to us what's the best practice for um, raising children in today's crazy world. A lot of our children stay online and do a lot of things uh, when we're not home. And the best way to really approach that is in Dr. Sachs' book on the collapse of parenting. He also has the Girls on the Edge book and Boys Adrift. And so um, <laughs> these three books have been my you know, keepsake and I've recommended them to so many people. And I hope that you all enjoy his talk today. After the two hours of the lecture, we will also be um, available for comments and for questions. And so all you do is click on the bottom and you'll get the comments, they'll come up. And I'll be reading the questions for the audience, uh, for him so that he can answer them online. I hope that- Dr. Sachs, All right, here we go. Well, again, I want to thank uh, everyone at the Islamic Foundation of Greater St. Louis for giving me this opportunity. A word about my background, I earned my undergraduate degree at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My doctorate in psychology and my medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I am a practicing physician. Uh, visiting schools 20 years ago. <clears throat> I visited over 460 schools over the last 20 years. Four books. Uh, and I've prepared a handout for you. Uh, you don't need the handout now. And I would encourage you not to pull it up now. It's 16 pages. It's basically an annotated bibliography. I'm going to be uh, citing a lot of research, a lot of papers. And if you'd like to... Uh, consult those primary sources. You will find the links in your handout. Also, all the main points of the presentation, uh, the guidance is in the handout. Uh, to save you the trouble of taking notes, I'll show you this link again. I just wanted you to know that it is available. Uh, so that you don't feel like you need to be taking notes or trying to find the primary sources. They're all in the handout. So I'm going to begin by asking you a question. When I do this, some version of this presentation in person, I ask people to raise their hands. I'm not able to do this because this is uh, remote, but I want you to imagine raising your hand in just a moment. And this question is based on a particular longitudinal cohort study. And you hear me saying that a lot this afternoon, a longitudinal cohort study. It means a study in this case in which uh, investigators recruited a large number of kids very early in life and then followed them throughout childhood, adolescence, and right into adulthood. When each of these kids was 12 years old, they brought them in for a comprehensive psychological assessment. Quantify for each one of these kids, their openness to new ideas, to get their grades at school, uh, with a comprehensive psychological assessment, you can quantify emotional stability, friendliness and agreeableness, self-control. So you measure all these parameters at 12 years of age. You follow these kids for another 20 years. 20 years later, when these kids are now 32 years old, you track them down. And you determine for each one of these adults, because that's what they are now, they're 32 years old, you determine their health, their wealth, and their happiness, their life satisfaction using objective measures. And again, these are all validated objective measures. One of the five parameters shown here, one of these five parameters powerfully and accurately predicts health and wealth and happiness but only one of these five parameters. The other four out of five predict one or none of those three principal outcomes. But, but one of these five parameters powerfully and accurately 
One of these five parameters measured at 12 years of age powerfully and accurately predicts that individual's health and wealth and happiness 20 years later when that individual is 32 years old. And when I do this presentation in person, I'll say, raise your hand. If that one key factor to new ideas. And people look around to see what other people are, are doing. Raise your hand if you think it's grades at school. Raise your hand if you think it's emotional stability. Raise your hand if you think it is friendliness and agreeableness. Raise your hand if you think it is self-control. I'm going to keep you in suspense. I won't tell you right now which of those five, which of those five factors powerfully and accurately predicts health, wealth, and happiness 20 years later. I will tell you this afternoon. I want you to be thinking about it right now. Let's go back almost 60 years. Researchers back in that era found that when people came to the United States from overseas, and did not speak English or did not speak English well, their children were at higher risk of becoming anxious or depressed or disengaging from school with children born and raised in the United States. And so a consensus arose among American researchers in the early 60s that when people arrive here from overseas, they should get their children to speak English fluently, to assimilate into American culture, the parents should learn English. And the grounds for that was that the research showed that if you did that, you improved outcomes. You decreased the risk of anxiety and depression. You decreased the risk of disengagement from school and so forth. Uh, one of the first citations in your handout is to a monograph by Dr. Milton Gordon, published by Oxford University Press in 1964. Putting together this research on the benefits of assimilation, that immigrants who assimilate do better than immigrants who do not. I want to rush to two disclaimers. First of all, I am not endorsing Dr. Gordon's recommendations. In a moment, I do not think assimilation is a wise strategy today. Uh, and I am not suggesting that 1964 were the good old days. The United States in 1964 was much more racist, much more sexist, and much more xenophobic than today. There are no good old days. Every era has its challenges. But I do think we can learn from the past. And it is a matter of empirical fact that 60 years ago, becoming American, speaking English at home, and assimilating into culture, into American culture, did decrease the risk of anxiety, decrease the risk of depression, and decrease the risk of disengagement from school. It was all true 60 years ago. It is not true today. And I think we can learn from that. So I want you to imagine two families living in West County. In fact, living next door uh, in town and country, say. The two families are very similar. They both consist of a mother, a father, a teenage son, and a teenage daughter. Patients of the parents are the same in both households. Household income is the same in both households. The big difference between these two households is that in one household, mother, father, son, and daughter were all born in the United States. They speak English at home. In the adjacent home, mother, father, son, and daughter were born in Bangalore, India. They have just arrived here, but they do not speak English at home. They speak Gujarati in the home. Now, in which of these two homes are we more likely to find that the teenage girl is drinking alcohol or cutting herself with razor blades or is diagnosed with an eating disorder or has been diagnosed with anxiety or depression? On each of those parameters, it is now many times more likely the American girl has those problems compared to the girl who just arrived here from India. In which home is it more likely that the teenage boy will say that school is a stupid waste of time or that the boy has been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder or has been arrested for street racing. Each of those parameters, it is many times more likely that the 
boy born and raised in the United States has those problems. Boy who just arrived here from India is very unlikely to have any one of those problems. Researchers first began to document this in the late 1990s. They were startled, they were surprised because they had been raised on the earlier research that being born and raised in the United States was an advantage. And so they were surprised to discover in their own research that that was no longer true. That being born and raised in the United States is now a disadvantage. We have immigrants now do better in school, are more likely to win the spelling bee, are more likely to win the science fair, are more likely to earn academic honors, are less likely, the children of immigrants are now much less likely to be binge drinking or cutting themselves with razor blades or to be anxious or depressed. And so they coined this phrase, the immigrant paradox, because they regarded it as paradoxical. That immigrants now have an advantage over people born and raised in the United States, in the United States. Now, that boy and that girl who just arrived here from India, the first week, the first month that they are here, they are very unlikely to have any of these problems. But if they stay here, and especially if they begin speaking English at home as a marker of assimilation into American culture, the risk begins to rise. Dr that a dose response effect. The term dose response effect is a term borrowed from toxicology, the study of poisons. And it means the more that you are exposed to the poison and the higher the dose, the more likely you are to experience a bad outcome. American popular culture is now toxic, children and teenagers. And I say that not in a derogatory sense, in a descriptive sense. The researchers find that the more exposure a child or teenager has to American popular culture, the more likely they are to experience a bad outcome, like anxiety, depression, suicidal self-injury, disengagement from school. And this leads to the first of many practical suggestions. Again, my focus this afternoon is not on theory, but on practice. Whoa, Mesa is sending me a text. Uh, the sound is cutting out. That's the problem. That's why okay. I, I had tried a microphone earlier and I cut it out because it seemed to be a problem. Let's plug it back in. Because I don't think it's the internet. We see you perfectly. It's just the sound. <laughs> Right, how that? It's still cutting out a little bit. All right, let's. How's that? I think that's better. We'll All right. And see how it works. Okay. Uh, uh, Mesa, I can see you on the screen. So if you just wave your hand or talk to me, I'll I'll hear what you're saying. Uh, so now I'm using my microphone. Anyhow. So again, our focus this afternoon is on some practical, concrete, evidence-based strategies that you can use to improve the odds for your child. And here's the first, based on the research on the immigrant paradox. If your first language was not English, if you grew up speaking a different language, speak that native language at home. Do not speak English at home. Ensure that your kids are fluent in your native language. Your native language, not American English, should be the language spoken in your household. Find other families that speak your language and get together with them. Do things with them so that your kid can be comfortable and, and get lots of experience talking to other kids in this language. So I've done, I think I counted up nine different presentations for the Islamic Association of Greater Detroit, IAGD, and I'll be mentioning some of those this afternoon. But one of them, I think this was in Farmington Hills, which is a suburb northwest of Detroit. I did a talk, something like this one, and afterwards a mother and father came up to talk to me to share their story. Uh, this mother and father had both been born and raised in Syria, but had lived in the United States for many years. They had four kids. And they normally speak Arabic at home. But they told me that when their son wants to be disrespectful, he switches to English. 
And dad told me his whole body language changes. He slouches, his eyes narrow. He gets a smirk on his face. Dad told me it's like Justin Bieber just walked into the house. English has become the language of disrespect. The language of disrespect. What happened? This was not true 40 years ago, 50 years ago. In that era, being American was an advantage. Speaking English at home was an advantage. Now it's not. What happened and what can we learn from this? Why is becoming American, speaking English at home and participating in American culture, now a major risk factor for anxiety, depression, drug and alcohol use, disengagement from school, and many other bad outcomes? That's one of the questions we're going to answer this afternoon, again, with some very concrete guidance that you can apply in your home. So here is a report looking at proportion of Americans with major depressive disorder, depressed people in the, who've been diagnosed with depression in the last 12 months between 2009 and 2017. So this ends before the pandemic. Our focus this afternoon is not on the pandemic, which is a, a different topic, but it doesn't change anything that we're talking about here. So if you look at the oldest group, it's been pretty flat. You look at 26 to 49 year olds, it's been pretty flat. But you look at younger Americans and beginning around 2011, 2012, you see things going up and up and up with no taper in that trend line. And for adolescents, 12 to 17 years of age, again, this same upward trend beginning around 2011. Percent of Americans reporting serious psychological distress in the last month, again, ending before the pandemic. For the oldest Americans over 50, no, tr no trend. For 26 to 49 year olds, not much of a trend. But for the youngest Americans, they don't have adolescents on this parameter, but for Americans 18 to 25, again, you see a inflection point around 2012 and a steady upward twin trend since that time. Now the pandemic has, if anything, accelerated this, uh, but why, what happened beginning in 2012? Why has the rate of depression uh, even suicide uh, increased steadily and dramatically uh, beginning around 2012, 2013. That's one of the questions we're going to answer uh, this afternoon. Again, with a focus on what you can do to improve the odds for your kids. Again, I find it very useful to contrast American culture today with American culture a generation ago. I've lived in this country all my life. There was a sociologist at Johns Hopkins in the 1960s who went across the United States and uh, did a great deal of research specifically in the Midwest, in Illinois and Missouri. Uh, his, he and his researchers would interview American high school kids and would ask some questions, structured questionnaire. One of, the, one of the questions they would always ask was, if all your friends wanted you to join a particular club, but one of your parents did not approve, would you still join? And in that era, the majority of American teens said no, they would not join because the opinion of their parents mattered more than the combined opinion of all their peers. Between 2011 and 2019, I posed an updated version of Dr. Coleman's questions to American uh, middle school and high school kids I asked them, if all your friends wanted you to sign up for a particular social media app, would you consult your parents first? And the most common answer I got from American kids was not yes, was not no, it was laughter. They'd burst out laughing. In 2019, I asked this question, and I remember a girl saying, <laughs> she, she said, you know, if I, if I talked to my parents about TikTok, they'd probably think I was talking about some kind of alarm clock or something. You know, these kids may say they love their parents but they value the opinion of their same age peers more. That's a big change. Most cultures have been characterized by strong bonds across generations and kids have been looking to the grownups for guidance. 
but increasingly researchers find the primary of attachment, primary attachment to American children and teens is to other kids their own age. And it makes a big difference because good parents offer unconditional attachment, but kids don't. Good parents nurture, but most kids can't. Good parents sacrifice for their children without expecting anything in, in return, but kids rarely do so for other kids their own age. So that's my daughter, uh, Sarah, 14 years old. Suppose she were to say to me, I hate you. I'm never gonna talk to you ever again as long as I live. Well, that's, that's never happened. Uh, but suppose she were to say that. Well, her mother and I would discuss and decide uh, what privileges she would lose and for how long as a result of that outburst. But nothing fundamental will change. She will not lose her place in our house. We won't stop loving her. There's nothing that she could do or say that would cause us to stop loving her. And she knows that, and we are her primary attachment. And so she can relax because she knows that no matter what, that foundation will not be shaken. But suppose she says those same words to a kid at school. I hate you. I'm never going to talk to you ever again as long as I live. Well, that friendship is over, or it is at least badly damaged. Peer relations are contingent and ephemeral, which is a fancy way of saying they can change overnight. And every kid knows it. You want to you wanna see an American teenage girl have a total meltdown? Here's what you do. Take her phone from her without warning. And she will totally freak out. She'll be like, Sonia doesn't know I don't have my phone. What if she texts me and I don't answer? She's going to think I'm ignoring her. She's going to think I don't like her. You can go from being the most popular girl to being the odd girl out in one day, in five minutes. And every kid knows it. So they are glued to their phone. You have to keep checking. Again, I've consulted with the comparative anthropologists whom I cite in my books. And what the anthropologists teach us is when you look at how other people have lived in other times and other places, you find that cultures that last have one thing in common. They teach kids to respect adults. And that's true in East Asia, it's true in South Asia, it's true in Europe, it's true in South America, it's true in the Pacific Islands. It is a very robust finding of human cultures that cultures that endure teach the children to respect the grown-ups. And that was true for American culture. By American culture, I mean the culture of people in the United States who spoke English at home. You look at the most popular TV shows from 50 years ago, shows like The Dick Van Dyke Show or My Three Sons or The Andrew Griffith Show. These were the most popular shows in that era. And the parents in those shows are consistently knowledgeable, competent, reliable, thoughtful, productive, caring, and kind, really without exception. That is not true of American popular culture today. Uh, the Simpsons, the longest running television comedy on American uh, television. Uh, Homer Simpson is a bum, his son's an idiot. His wife varies, sometimes she's wise, more often she is not. The only one of the four uh, leads who's consistently wise and insightful is the daughter, Lisa. But I am not picking on this show. I really have high regard for The Simpsons. I think they have great insight into what's happened in American popular culture. In one episode of The Simpsons, you get to see inside Homer Simpson's brain. Homer Simpson's brain has three major drives, sleep, donuts, and beer. I think there's great insight there. If you imagine an American cartoon 50 years ago dep depicting the brain of an American man, it probably would have shown the entire brain as a sex drive. That was the stereotype of American men 50 years ago, that all they cared about was sex. Not anymore. Now it's sleep, donuts, and beer. I think there's great insight there. The testosterone levels of American men have fallen by half 
over the last 50 years. The sperm counts of American men have fallen by more than half over the last 50 years. So I think the people who write for The Simpsons have some real insight. In writing my book, The Collapse of Parenting, I reviewed the 150 most popular television shows in the United States. Of those 150 most popular shows, only one often or occasionally depicts a parent as knowledgeable and competent. That one exception is shown here, Blue Bloods starring Tom Selleck. None of the other 150 shows even occasionally depicts a parent as knowledgeable, competent, or reliable. On the contrary, parents are either absent or they are ridiculous. Uh, so, for example, Modern Family, much more typical of contemporary American television, the straight dad is always an idiot uh, whose ridiculous antics are the butt of the joke. We are expected to laugh at him for the stupid things he does. His three children are almost always wiser and more insightful than their idiot dad. This is true even on the Disney Channel. A dog with a blog shown here. The father, supposedly a school psychologist, knows nothing about what kids want or what kids need. The talking dog is always wiser and more insightful than the idiot dad. Uh, this uh, Disney show, Liv and Maddie, the two girls are as different as they can be. The one thing they agree on is that their mother, also supposedly a school psychologist, knows nothing about the behavior or motivation of teenagers. The two girls roll their eyes in disbelief at the ridiculous, clueless, out of touch suggestions made by their dumb mom. This is characteristic of American television today. It was not so 50 years ago. It is true today. Girls and boys are not born knowing what it means to be ladies and gentlemen. They have to be taught. And if we don't teach them, uh, they will look elsewhere. They will look to the marketplace. And we, we don't, as a, a general rule, American parents no longer teach kids what it means to be ladies and gentlemen. So kids look to the marketplace and the marketplace has changed. So that's a photograph of Sam Cook. More than 50 years ago, Sam Cooke had a number one hit song in this country, which I vividly remember growing up. It was everywhere. It was playing on every station. He sang, don't know much about history. He sang, now, I don't claim to be an A student, but I'm trying to be, because maybe by being an A student baby, I could win your love for me. He goes on to mention French, geometry, and trigonometry as subjects in which he's going to try harder to earn an A rather than a B because he believes that by earning an A, he can raise his status in the eyes of the pretty girl. That was characteristic of American culture in that generation. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, 60 years ago, the culture of people who spoke English at home was the culture of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Simon and Garfunkel, Petulia Clark, Aretha Franklin. That is not American culture today. American culture today, I think, is best described as a culture of disrespect. That's the title of chapter one of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, that American popular culture has become a culture of disrespect. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that when you look at the most popular shows, the most popular videos, so the most popular video uh, last summer was this song called WAP. Number one, nationwide, breaking all kinds of records. WAP is an acronym which I cannot even say out loud because I don't want to offend you, but it refers to vaginal lubrication. This is not a song about love. Love is never mentioned. It's not a song about relationship. It's a song about vaginal lubrication. Uh, and it was hugely successful in this country. Number one hit song broke the record for most streams, 93 million streams for the video in one week. No video had ever done that before. Debuted at number one on Billboard's Top 100, the most popular song in the United States. Spent 10 weeks in the top three. 
and it's got the F word, the N word, the A word, which is in the title. I'm not going to read these lyrics out loud. Uh, but the reviews were ecstatic. The New York Times and the Wall Street Journal don't agree on much, but what they did agree on is that this is the greatest song ever. The New York Times reviewer was thrilled by the song's praise of female sexual desire. The Wall Street Journal praised this song as a historic sign that women artists are making their mark. Teen Vogue said that women everywhere rejoiced in the glory of this song. A woman posted a tweet praising this song's promotion of sexual agency, and her tweet has had more than 110,000 likes on Twitter. What is a boy supposed to see when he sees that the most popular video in the United States present women who describe themselves as looking for a beating, who want to gag and choke in the course of sexual intimacy, and that video is number one and praised by women, writing for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Teen Vogue. How is that boy supposed to know that at not every woman is looking for a beating? How is he supposed to know if he's received no instruction? Again, uh, there's a link in your handout to my article uh, where I link to these various reviews, so you don't have to Google them yourselves, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Teen Vogue. I talk about the importance of parents knowing what their kids are watching on YouTube. And look, I've done I've done a number of presentations since this song uh, debuted last summer, and some parents push back. Uh, one parent said, "My child was attending this Zoom, and my child is 12 years old, and I don't want him to see those words. And I'm very angry that Dr. Sachs displayed those words on this video." And I answer that parent, "Do you have strict limits in place on what your child can see on YouTube?" Very, very few parental monitoring software will limit the number one video on YouTube. Uh, does your, is your kid allowed to watch YouTube without you looking over his shoulder? If so, he's already seen this. If he's allowed to watch the Grammys, he's already seen this. It was, a, it was featured in the Grammys last month. Uh, this is American popular culture. Your son's already seen this video. And the video is much worse than the words. And this is not an exception. This song is not an exception. It is typical. So Bruno Mars swept the Grammys. Very rare in the history of that show. The Grammys, of course, is uh, where uh, the Recording Academy gives the awards to what they consider to be the best R&B album, the best uh, album, the song of the year, best song. All those Grammys went to Bruno Mars. There he is holding up his Grammy for best song. Moving on to a different number one song here. These lyrics, uh, most of them I can read. I got a condo in Manhattan, baby girl, what's happening? You and your blank invited. So turn around and drop it for a player. Drop, drop it for me. His videos had over 1.4 billion views. 1.4 billion views. So he's addressing a woman he appears not to know. He offers her champagne and then diamonds and then a shopping spree in Paris and then just offers to give her his credit card if she will just turn around and pop it for a player because that's what I like. That's the title of the song. That's what I like. He's offering money for sex. Again, no mention of love or relationship. He's offering money for sex. Money makes her smile. You know, the Grammys were weird that year because this famous actress, Janelle Monet got up and gave a little sermon about sexual harassment. She said, I'm here to tell you that time's up for sexual harassment of any kind. Time's up. And she got a standing ovation for her little sermon. And then a few minutes later, Bruno Mars got the Grammy for best song for his song celebrating sexual harassment. I mean, imagine a young man in the workplace approaching a female colleague and saying, hey, baby girl, what's happening? You and your blank invited and then offering her money for sex. What would happen to that man? Well, he'd be fired. Or if he was lucky, he might just be disciplined and, and attend a, a uh, sexual harassment workshop where we would learn that it is never permissible to offer a colleague money for sex. 
But this man might reasonably respond. He might say, well, that's exactly what Bruno Mars did. And he got six Grammys and the number one video, number one song. How is a young man to know if he has received no instruction, if he is immersed in a culture that is presenting him, it is teaching him that this is what you do, that this is what's cool. That's part of what I mean by the culture of disrespect. Now, I'm not saying that American popular culture is utterly depraved. It is not. It's like a big city. And there are some great things going on in, in any big uh, city. There's an art museum, a science museum, history. But there are also high crime neighborhoods. And a good parent would not let their kid wander without protection or guidance in a big city, they might get hurt. You must install parental monitoring apps on your kids' devices. These apps are essential to limit exposure to the toxic elements of contemporary American popular culture. And again, I've gotten all kinds of pushback from parents who say, come on, why did you have to show those words? Why did you have to feature those number one hit songs? Why couldn't you talk about other hit songs? I featured those songs because you have to know how toxic American culture is right now. These are the number one hit songs, the number one hit videos. If you're not limiting your kid's exposure, this is what your kid is seeing. And kids are not born knowing what it means to be ladies and gentlemen. They look to their culture. And if what they find there is WAP and Bruno Mars, that's what they'll learn. So far, everything I've said applies equally to girls and boys, but now we're going to move in a somewhat different direction. We're going to talk about some issues that are more salient to boys, and we're going to then talk about some issues that are more salient to girls. So I wrote a book called Boys Adrift, The Five Factors Driving the Growing Epidemic of Unmotivated Boys and Underachieving Young Men. And that book begins with uh, lots of data, again, showing that there is a growing gender gap in this country. Girls are pulling farther away, not because girls are doing so much better, they're not, but because boys are doing so much worse. American boys are now much less likely to be engaged and motivated compared to their sisters. And you'll see this in family after family. And I saw this as a family doctor, it's where the book came from. Families in my own practice where the daughter's doing extremely well in school and the brother's a goofball who just wants to play video games. And I saw this over and over. And that's what got me looking into whether this is true nationwide. And it is. It is true of white kids. It is true of black kids. It is true of uh, Spanish speaking kids. It is true of uh, Jewish kids, uh, Christian kids, uh, Muslim kids, and kids uh, from families of atheists. Uh, it is a very robust phenomenon in this country. What's driving it? Again, this was not characteristic of America. I'm look, when I graduated from high school in Northern Ohio in 1977, all the kids in the honors assembly, almost all of them were boys. Boys greatly outnumbered girls among those receiving academic honors in that era. Today, girls greatly outnumber boys. I mean, we all applaud the fact that girls are doing better, but why didn't it level out at 50-50? Why do we now find that girls greatly outnumber boys among those earning academic honors? Why? Well, there are five factors in play, but this is not the boys adrift talk. So we're not gonna talk about four of those five factors. I just wanna talk about one of them in our time this afternoon. I wanna talk about video games. So researchers find that girls and boys tend to play different games, different video games, and they play them differently. So that's Candy Crush, uh, and that's Homescapes. When you look at who's playing Candy Crush and Homescapes, you, uh, you find that girls outnumber boys. When you ask specifically who has spent more than three hours in the last week playing games like Candy Crush or Homescapes, you find that girls greatly outnumber boys. Most popular video games for American boys are Minecraft, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto. Fortnite is falling fast, but it still occupies the number four spot. RDR2. 
Average girl playing Candy Crush or Homescapes typically spends about 20 minutes in the session. Average boy playing Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto typically spends about two and a half hours in a session. Well, what is the relationship between how much time you spend playing video games and how well you do in school? Well, researchers find that below a threshold of about six hours a week, there is no relationship. Kid who spends five hours a week playing video games does no better, no worse in school on average compared to the kid who doesn't play video games at all. Beyond that threshold of six hours, there is a linear and negative association. So the kid who spends 10 hours a week playing video games does less well on average compared to the kid who spends five hours a week playing video games. The kid who spends 20 hours a week playing video games does much less well. And I spoke to Craig Anderson, lead investigator on that study, and I asked him, why is that so? And he answered with one word. He said, displacement, displacement. What does Craig Anderson mean when he says displacement? What he means by displacement is that if you're spending 20 hours a week playing video games, that's 20 hours a week, you're not doing something else like studying or sleeping. The average American boy now spends over nine hours a week playing video games compared to about 90 minutes a week for the average girl. You'll find these guidelines in your handout based on the research. No more than 40 minutes a night on school nights playing video games, no more than an hour a day on weekends, and your minutes do not roll over. So if you go three weeks without playing video games, that does not mean you're allowed seven hours for a binge on Saturday. Your minutes do not roll over. No screen time, no video games until all the chores are done and all the homework is done. And that means no devices in the bedroom, no video game console in the bedroom, no cell phones in the bedroom. We'll come back to that. Continuing with research on video games. Researchers studying video games distinguish between rule governed games and rule breaking games. So Madden NFL football is a rule governed video game. If you try to score a touchdown by going out of bounds up into the bleachers and coming down in the end zone, you did not score a touchdown. You went out of bounds and the play ended when you went out of bounds. Compare that to a game like Need for Speed, which is an auto racing game that you may be racing on a street, but if you just race on the street, you're going to lose. You've got to break the usual rules associated with racing. You've got to drive your car up on the sidewalk. You've got to drive through an occupied building, break down the door and come out the other side to get that shortcut to win the game. A game like Needs, Need for Speed rewards rule breaking. You, know, you have to break rules in order to win. Well, they found, uh, so these researchers, and again, the link, the research is in your handout, the link to the research the citation. They, fo they followed teenagers who were playing rule governed game like men in NFL football and FIFA soccer and NBA basketball with kids who were playing rule breaking games like Need for Speed or Grand Theft Auto. And they found that the more time you spend playing rule breaking games, the more likely this teenager is to be arrested for speeding, speeding or another moving violation in a motor vehicle and is three times more likely to cause a motor vehicle accident. These games influence how kids drive and the kids insist they don't. You'll ask the kid and I've done this myself. I say, okay, so you like to play need for speed. Do you think it affects how you drive? They'll say, no, I'm not going to drive any different in a real car. I know it's not a video game. They have no awareness of how the game is changing them. Video games reward short attention spans and program short attention spans and distractibility. When you're playing a game like call of duty, and you're a sniper and you're trying to kill the bad guy, if you're just focused on the bad guy, you're going to get killed. you got to be constantly aware of everything that's going on around you. You've got to be distractible. If there's a little rustle in the leaves at the top left-hand corner, that could be your only warning that there's a sniper over there getting ready to shoot you. The most popular video games reward distractibility. And this is not helpful in school. When you're taking a quiz, you got to be able to shut out the kid who's buzzing and humming on your right and the kid who's chewing gum on your left. you got to block out those distractions. But video games reward distractibility and program a short attention span. So it's not too surprising that the more time kids spend playing video games, the less able they are to concentrate and focus, the more likely they are subsequently to be diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. 
Researchers define a violent video game as a game in which you must kill in order to win. So they did this remarkable study where they recruited more than 3,000 kids at 12 years of age, and then followed each of these kids for more than three years. At enrollment at age 12, you do this comprehensive psychological assessment to quantify for each one of these kids, to what extent is this kid altruistic or selfish, honest or dishonest, patient or impatient, gentle or hostile. And then you get every demographic variable and you control for those variables. Demographic variables such as race, ethnicity, religion, household income, language spoken at home, family composition, parental involvement. So the way to conceptualize this study with all those demographic variables control, I want you to imagine two 12 year old boys living next door in identical families. And by identical families, I mean that the families are identical in terms of race, ethnicity, religion, family composition, parental involvement. And both these boys spend 20 hours a week playing video games. The difference between these two boys is one of these boys, the parents will not allow him to play violent games. So he's playing games like Madden NFL football, NBA basketball, FIFA soccer. The boy next door, his parents don't know what video games he's playing. He's in the bedroom with the door closed. And so he's playing the most popular video games, which are violent games, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, RDR2. At enrollment, these boys are identical on all these psychological parameters, honesty, patience, altruism. But after three years, the boy playing the violent games has changed. He's become more selfish, less honest, less patient compared to the boy playing the sports games. They're both playing 20 hours a week. And after three years, not after a week or a month, but after three years, the difference between these two boys who were identical at enrollment is pretty large. After three years, the difference between these two boys is comparable to the difference between a boy raised in a loving and nurturing home all his life and a boy raised in a violent and abusive home all his life. And yet, once again, the boy playing the violent games has no awareness. So let me tell you one of the clever things that the researchers did. When the kid is enrolled at 12 years of age, the technician says, all right, we're all done. Thank you very much for your time. Go out that door, make a left turn. You'll find the waiting area where your parents are waiting for you. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Boy goes down the hallway. There's a $20 bill on the floor. At age 12, most of the kids pick up the $20 bill and walk it back into the technician and say, hey, somebody must have just dropped a $20 bill on the floor. Would you please turn it in lost and found? I'm sure they'll be looking for it. Fast forward three years, come back for the comprehensive psychological assessment to quantify to what extent this kid is, is changed in terms of honesty, patience, altruism, et cetera. Once again, the technician says, all right, we're all done. Thank you very much. Uh, exit that door, make a left turn, go to the waiting area. It goes out in the hallway. Once again, there's a $20 bill on the floor. The kid who's been playing the sports games like Madden NFL football, bends over, picks up the $20 bill, walks it back into the technician and says, hey, uh, somebody must have just dropped a $20 bill. Would you please, uh, <laughs> you know, it's the funniest thing. Same exact thing happened here three years ago. It's like somebody here is just sprinkling $20 bills on the floor. <laughs> the boy who's been playing the violent games, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, goes out in the hallway, sees a $20 bill, looks both ways, there's nobody there, bends over, picks up the $20 bill, stuffs it in his pocket, leaves the building. But when you said to that boy, have you changed at all as a result of playing these games? Have you become, have you become any more li likely to take something that doesn't belong to you? This boy will say, no, I haven't changed. Certainly I haven't changed as a result of playing this game. I know it's just a game. He has no awareness of how much the game has changed him. Some violent games are worse than others. And by worse, the researchers mean they push this change from honest to dishonest, from uh, patient to impatient, from altruistic to selfish. They push this change farther and faster than other games. The worst games are games which employ what Anderson and Gentile call a moral inversion. A moral inversion means that in the context of the game, 
good is bad and bad is good. So for example, in Grand Theft Auto, you must acquire money and weapons. And you can get the best weapons by killing police officers. You have to kill them. Uh, that's the only way to get their weapons. So in the context of the game, it would be really clever to sneak up on some police officers and kill them before they know what you're up to, and that way you get their weapons. Now in the real world, to kill police officers just because they're police officers would be evil and wrong. But in the context of this game, it is a good and clever thing to do. If you wanna play Grand Theft Auto with a ready-made avatar, you must play as a man. There are no, there are no female avatars ready-made. There are women in the game. Uh, many of them are prostitutes. If you get wounded in your firefight with a police officer, you can restore your health to 100% by having sex with a prostitute. But that will cost you money. You go up to her, you ask her uh, how much she tells you, you give her that money, and then you have sex with her, meaning you watch your avatar flopping on top of her. Your health is restored to 100%. But you need money in order to win the game, to complete your mission. You don't have to do this, but it makes very good sense in the context of the game to take out your big knife and kill her. And then as she very realistically collapses and dies in a puddle of blood, you get your money back. That's the only way you can get your money back. You have to kill her. Now in the real world, to kill a prostitute to get your money back would be insane and evil. But in the context of this game, it is a good and clever thing to do. Your son should not be playing these games. Lawmakers in California said, are you kidding me? The most popular video game in the United States? And Grand Theft Auto was the most popular video game when it debuted in 2013, GTA 5. And that's the game we're talking about. The most popular video game in the United States has been shown now to change personality, to cause kids to be more selfish, less honest, less patient. They flew the researchers to Sacramento and heard their testimony and wrote a law. The California statute made it a civil offense to sell not just any violent game, but the worst violent games, games like Grand Theft Auto to a minor child, a child under 18. Basically, the California statute pushed these games in the same category as cigarettes, put them behind the counter. You'd have to show ideas, show that you're at least 18 in order to buy these worst games. But the video game industry immediately brought suit, filed a lawsuit claiming that the California statute violated their First Amendment rights of free speech. And the video game lawsuit went to the United States Supreme Court. And in a ruling written by Justice Antonin Scalia, the United States Supreme Court agreed with the video game industry and threw out the California statute, rendering it null and void. Justice Samuel Alito wrote a concurrence in which he said, I share the concerns of California parents and California lawmakers, he said, I have read the research of Anderson and Gentile. These games are heinous. That's the word he used. No child, no teenager should be playing a game where you get rewarded for killing police officers, for killing civilians. No child or teenager should be playing this game. But he continued. Nevertheless, it is the ruling of this court that deciding what games children will play is not the job of the California State Assembly. It is the job of the parent. And I've included a link to the full text of Justice Alito's concurrence in your handout. Because you need to understand there is no one else who can do this job for you. There can be no rule. There can be no law limiting the sale of any video game to any child, no matter how violent the game, no matter how young the child, there can be no limitation in law because the United States Supreme Court has so ruled. So it is your job to limit the games your son is playing. It is your job when your kid is going over to his friend's house 
to play to to play video games it's your job to call the parents and say hey my son's going to be hanging with your son tomorrow afternoon will there be a grown up around to make sure they're not playing games like grand theft auto and if the other parent says hey they go in the bedroom close the door i'm not going to waste my time chaperoning what video games two boys are playing if that's the parent's answer then it's your job to say i'm sorry you're not allowed to go to that house that is canceled. You must know what video games your son is playing. Unfortunately, we do have Common Sense Media. I have no affiliation with this group, but they do have accurate, unbiased assessments of video games available at no charge. This is their review of Grand Theft Auto. Gang violence, nudity, drug and alcohol abuse, Hardened criminals kill not only fellow gangsters, but also police officers and innocent civilians. Women are depicted as sexual objects with a strip club mini game. Okay, this is not appropriate for kids. Yeah, that's good. You don't have to play the game to know that. The review is accurate. Now, the games I've been talking about, when I said most popular, I should have said most popular for teenage boys 13 to 18 years of age for kids 9 to 12 years of age the number one video game right now is roblox three quarters of american children 9 to 12 years of age have played on the roblox platform and the latest data show they they spend three more than three they're spending more than three billion hours each month on that platform that's more than double than a year ago that's one of the effects of the pandemic has driven the popularity of Roblox with elementary school age children. Well, what is Roblox? It's not a game. It is a game platform. There are over 40 million games on Roblox with more than 30,000 new games being uploaded every day. Uh, in some of those games, you can solve puzzles and other Roblox games. You can explore a haunted castle or chat with strangers or adopt a pet or whack pigs with baseball bats or engage in simulated sex or in violent com combat. So what does Common Sense Media say about Roblox? Well, specifically with regard to sex, uh, you can engage in simulated sex acts using profanity that bypasses content filters, be groomed by predators, and it's very difficult to filter these games. So what are their recommendation no child under age 14 should be playing roblox we can argue about that but certainly but i can tell you this no kid over 14 wants to play roblox roblox is regarded as a platform for elementary school kids but elementary school kids should not be playing roblox this game needs to be blocked and again your parental monitoring app can block this game kids young kids should not be playing roblox again common sense media Video games are more of a boy's issue. When researchers ask who is spending 20 hours a week playing, excuse me, violent video games like Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, RDR2, boys outnumber girls by more than eight to one. So video games are more of a boy's issue. But girls have their issues as well. To understand some of the issues that affect girls more than boys. I want you to imagine a girl living in ancient times. By ancient times, I mean the year 2001, 20 years ago. It's the evening. She's writing in her diary. She's writing with a pen in a bound volume of blank pages. She's writing about who she likes, who she doesn't like, the kind of girl she most admires, the kind of woman she hopes to become, what she really wants out of life doing some important work. The great American psychologist Abraham Maslow said that figuring out what you really want out of life is not trivial. He believed that many adults were miserable because they were working hard at jobs they didn't like in pursuit of goals that were not meaningful to them. So this girl writing five pages about what do I really want? She's doing some important work. Fast forward to today. When I meet with middle school kids or high school kids, I'll ask them, who here is on Instagram? Most of the hands go up. Who here is on TikTok? All the hands go up. 
Who's on Facebook? A few hands go up. Who here has a diary? No hands. Or more specifically, in a room of 300 kids, four hands go up. And then I'll ask the kids, well, what's the difference between posting on Instagram and writing in a diary? I call only on kids who have their hands raised. Girl raises her hand. I call on her. She says, diary is private. Instagram is public. That's right. Diary is private. Instagram is public. When, research, when researchers look to see how American kids use social media, like Instagram or TikTok, they don't find any five-page essays about what I really want out of life. They find lots of photos and videos, mostly funny. Lots of photos, lots of videos. And this is true for boys and it's true for girls, but the photos are different. So a boy and a girl both go to a football game and they both take pictures of the game. But the boy, it turns out, is taking a picture of the game or of the pretty cheerleader at the game. The girl is turning the phone on herself and she's taking 100 selfies at the game. And then that evening, she's looking through those 100 selfies to find two or three where she's laughing and the kids around her are laughing. And that's what she posts on her Instagram. Here I am at the game. We had a great time. Mike Stefanone, looking across the United States, uh, he's a researcher who's asked, who posts more, girls or boys? Girls post more. How much more? Five times more. Girls post 500% as many photos as the boys do. The difference between writing in your diary and posting a photo on Instagram is the difference between living and performing. Social media as used by American middle school and high school kids is a performance. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with a performance. A performance is a show that you put on to entertain or amuse other people. And I don't see anything wrong with that. As long as you understand that the performance has to come to an end and you take off your mask and resume your real life. My concern listening to American girls is that many of them are trapped in what I have come to call the cyber bubble of 24 seven texting and social media and the mask never comes off and the show never ends and it is exhausting and it is draining. These girls are connected, hyper-connected to other girls, their own age, but they are disconnected from themselves, disconnected from themselves. We now have good longitudinal cohort studies showing that the more time a teenager spends on social media, the more likely that teen is to become depressed. So here's one of those longitudinal cohort studies. So in this study, researchers look to see how much time these kids are spending looking at other kids' Instagram or looking to see how many likes they got on their own Instagram and the likelihood of them becoming depressed. And you find the more time they're spending on Instagram, the more likely they are to become depressed. And this is true for boys, the dashed line, but it is even more true for girls. It's a much bigger effect for girls than it is for boys. And that is a robust phenomenon. Robust meaning that multiple researchers with different cohorts of kids have now come to the same conclusion. I met with Kathy Charles at Napier University, different group of kids, same conclusion. The more time kids spend on social media like Instagram, the more likely they are to become depressed. But in her research, it was a huge effect for girls and a small effect for boys. And she did not know why. When I met with her, she did not know why. She was, she was very interested when I shared with her research by Carol Dweck and her colleagues at Stanford, showing that girls are very ready to believe that other girls are having more fun than they are, that other girls' lives are more interesting than their own life is. This turns out to be not at all true for boys. Turns out that boys greatly overestimate how interesting their own life is to other people. And girls use social media differently than boys do. So a boy and a girl both get sick. They both throw up. The boy posts a photo of his own vomit on his Instagram. Girls never do that. 
Vanessa gets a puppy and it's a really cute puppy. And she takes 200 pictures of her cute puppy and posts a dozen of the cutest pictures on her Instagram. Here's my new puppy. Isn't it cute? But I have some very sad news. Vanessa's puppy got loose, ran out into the street, got run over by a truck. Vanessa's puppy is dead. But she did not post a photo of the dead dog on her Instagram. Boys do. It would not be at all unusual for an American boy to post a photo of the mangled corpse of his dead dog on his Instagram. Now imagine a girl, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age, in her bedroom alone, looking at all the other girls' Instagram. There's Emily at the football game. She's having a great time. There's Madison at the party. She's having a blast. There's Vanessa with her new puppy. Isn't it cute? I'm just sitting there not doing anything. My life sucks. The more time a girl spends on social media like Instagram, the more likely she is to become anxious and or depressed. That's a large effect for girls, a much smaller effect for boys. You now understand three mechanisms that drive that sex difference between girls and boys and the outcomes of social media. First of all, girls are more invested in their posts. They post five times as many photos as the boys do on average. And if you don't like Jacob's photo of the pretty cheerleader, he doesn't care. But if you don't like Emily's photo of Emily, she's going to take that personally. Girls are mostly, mostly the fun stuff, the happy stuff. Boys post a much wider range of their lived experience. This boy looking at Jacob's dead dog or Brett's vomit is unlikely to want to be Jacob or Brett. And boys greatly overestimate how interesting their own life is to begin with. So boys are protected to some degree from the most toxic effects of social media. Girls are more vulnerable. Boys are more vulnerable to the addictive properties of video games, as we just saw. So what can you do about it? Well, the first step is to recognize that most kids are not masters of time management. In one study, they asked this 14-year-old girl, how much time were you on Instagram last night? She said, uh, 40 minutes. Turned out it was more than two hours. I don't think she was lying. I think she lost track of time. She was having fun. It is your job to inculcate good habits of time management. And the good news is there's lots of apps out there to help you do this. I've devoted one page of your handout to listing various apps that I've learned about. I am not endorsing one over the other. They have shortcomings and strengths, which I talk about in your handout. And I don't want to devote much of our time to debating the merits of different apps. Again, I hope you'll look at my discussion in your handout, but you must install some app. All of these apps will, first of all, tell you what your kid is doing with their device. And that's the first thing you have to know. I'm not suggesting that you prohibit social media, but you must limit social media. Three hours a day is too much. We're going to get to that in just a moment. And the first thing the app will do is it'll show you on your own phone or your own laptop. They all have dashboards so you can follow what your kid's doing remotely. You'll see what sites your kid is going to and how much time they're spending there. Then you can very easily limit how much time your kid is spending on social media. And I find, again, American parents are often skeptical. They're like, oh, come on. My daughter's just going to Google, how do I get around parental controls on the nanny? Well, I've done a great many events across Silicon Valley. I've actually spoken to some people who work for NetNanny. And they told me that NetNanny has employees whose full-time job is to Google the phrase, how do I get around parental controls on NetNanny? And every possible variation on that phrase. And they find that some kid has found a hole. They plug that. They patch it. And uh, usually within hours, and your app will update. These apps work. And explain to your kids, hey, my parents insisted on knowing where I was at all times. I have to know where you're at all times. Except now it's not out there, it's online. I will know every website you visit and what you do there because that is my job as your parent. 
no more than 40 minutes a day on social media. Where does that come from? Well, the citation's in your handout. It's a study by Jean Twenge and her colleague looking at data from more than 220,000 kids. And again, the X axis is the amount of time spent on social media and the Y axis is bad outcomes. And they find between zero and 30 minutes that curve is flat. But there's an inflection point between 30 and 40 minutes a day. And beyond 30 minutes a day, and certainly beyond 40 minutes a day, it's pretty linear and it's going up. That's the evidence on uh, that and similar studies are the evidence on which I base that guideline, no more than 40 minutes a day. Why the inflection point at 40 minutes a day? I've discussed, I've discussed this with Gene Twangy and other researchers. And I've also discussed this with the teenagers, and I think I know. The researchers and even the kids themselves will tell you that kids who are spending 30 minutes or less a day on social media are using social media to facilitate their social life. They're sending out a message to their friends. Hey, uh, how about can we get together this Saturday at two o'clock? I'm thinking before the pandemic, you know, we'll we'll go shopping or we'll get together Saturday night and we'll do this. They're using social media to facilitate their social life. But kids who are spending more than 40 minutes a day are producing, they're creating, they're editing photos or videos that they are going to post to TikTok or Instagram. Well, what's wrong with that? Isn't it better to be a producer than a consumer? I mean, creative and all that stuff, creativity, what's wrong with creativity? Why are boys happier? So I'm not talking too much about the pandemic in this presentation. I can tell you nothing about this presentation has changed as a result of the pandemic. It's gotten worse. But we do know that a lot of kids in the United States have been spending more time online as a result of the pandemic. Boys are spending more time playing video games. Girls are spending more time on social media. And we also know that boys have gotten happier, if anything, and girls are getting more miserable. So Julie Jargon, writing for the Wall Street Journal, uh, wrote a column last August in which she said, hey, if you have a daughter, get her off social media and get her to play video games instead so she can be happy. Okay, it is a true statement that boys spending many hours a week playing video games tend to be happier than girls spending many hours a week on social media. Why? The most popular video games for boys all have one thing in common. If you invest enough time and energy in the video game, you will win. You will be master of the universe. So there's a famous PlayStation commercial that is hugely popular. Uh, where a pretty ordinary guy climbs out of a pretty ordinary looking car and speaking directly to the camera says, who are you to be ordinary? Who are you to be afraid? Who are you to be anonymous? You whose name should be spoken in reverent tones or in terrified whispers. We will not be denied. And there he is as things are blowing up around him. And he jumps literally into a video game and starts attacking people. And the last line of the video is greatness awaits. You can be great. Just put in the time and the effort into the video game and you will be master of the universe. That's the promise that PlayStation is making in this commercial. And they keep that promise. If you put in the hours, days, weeks, months, to become master of the, of the game, you will be master of the universe. You will be. But girls are less likely than their brothers to spend hundreds of hours playing violent video games, killing imaginary or virtual enemies. Instead, girls are more likely to invest that time and effort into making videos for Instagram or TikTok. So Joella Joni Siwa, made a video at 12 years of age. Video is called Boomerang. It's not a very good video. It's not very funny. It tries to be, but it's, it's not very funny. And the dancing is not 
impressive at all. But it went viral. And even YouTube experts cannot explain why one video goes viral and another doesn't. It's, it's a mystery. It truly went viral. It's had almost 1 billion views on YouTube. And this girl is now a major social media influencer with 20 million followers on Instagram. And she is famous and wealthy. She's now 17. That's Jojo Siwa. I'm not picking on her, but she's utterly ordinary. She's not prettier than other. So let me, I, without knocking her, uh, she's got her that you can buy a Joe, Joe Siwa fashion doll on Amazon, which is quite popular, uh, strangely enough. So I don't want to knock on Jojo Siwa. I want to tell you about a girl I know who told me I want to be the next Jojo Siwa. This girl said, I'm prettier than she is. That's true. This girl said, I'm a better dancer than she is. That's true. The girl said, my video is way more fun and funnier than her video. And that's true. And this girl that I know spent two months working hard to create a perfect video, funny, great dancing. And she posted it. And three weeks later, she's had a grand total of 91 views. Not 91 million, not 91,000, just 91. And a handful of nasty comments. There's no limit to the number of boys who can be master of the universe in video game world. But only a few videos will go viral. There are more than 30 million web pages about Jojo Siwa. I can't find any pages devoted to the girls who are just as pretty, better dancers, but whose videos did not go viral. Your daughter has no way of knowing that for every Jojo Siwa, there are at least a million wannabes whose videos fizzled. That your daughter's odds of success are less than one in a million. And it doesn't matter how hard she works. The great deception is that if you work hard enough, you can be the next Jojo Siwa. It's not true. It's not true. And I've personally counseled girls who discovered that on their own. And the result in their cases was despair. And your daughter's immersed in stories of other girls who rocketed to fame with minimal investment of time and money. Girls like Jojo Siwa. So that Wall Street Journal columnist says, get your daughter off social media. And on to video games, because social media leads to despair. And that's true. But the solution is not to get your daughter playing Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto instead. That's not good advice. Better advice is to turn off the screen and connect your kid to the real world. Up to 30 minutes a day on social media is okay. Now, some parents, again, say, no, 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 no. I don't allow social media. I'm fine with that. I know some of those parents and their families well, and they're all doing great. If that works for you, fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm saying the evidence does not support a complete prohibition because what the researchers find is that up to 30 minutes a day, there's no, there's no downside in terms of risk of anxiety, depression, or other bad outcomes. Up to 30 minutes a day is not associated with bad outcomes but not more than 40 minutes a day. And that's where you need your parental monitoring app. When they hit that 30 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever you choose, they will be logged out and they will not be able to log on for 24 hours. If your daughter wants to dance, that's great. My daughter takes five different dance classes every week, five hours of structured dance instruction, and she loves it. LA, uh, tap, and modern. She loves it. But she dances because she loves to dance, not because she wants to be a YouTube celebrity. She's never posted a video, and she has no interest in posting a video. Many girls are going to bed with their phone switched on. And at 2 in the morning, your daughter's getting a text, OMG. Melissa and Jason just broke up. This is really big news. We'll have to talk about this. 
Parents are amazed to ha- to find that half the ninth grade class is awake and texting at two in the morning. Look, the rules of good parenting have not changed in 20 years. But 20 years ago, a girl could not accept a phone call at two in the morning because the phone would ring. And the parents would not allow it because they knew it's more important to get a good night's sleep than to be up for an hour in the middle of the night exchanging gossip. That was true 20 years ago, and it's just as true today. The only thing that has changed is the technology. It's now very easy for your daughter to accept that text message at 2 in the morning because the phone never rang. It buzzed. She has her phone on vibrate mode, and she's not talking. She's texting. But just because it's easy for her to do it doesn't mean it should happen. This is your job. At 9 o'clock at night, the very latest, you take the device from your kid, you switch it off, and you put it in the charger. The charger from now on is going to be in the parent's bedroom. They can have it back tomorrow morning. It is not reasonable to put this burden in the lap of your 14-year-old. What is your daughter supposed to say tomorrow in school when her friend says, hey, I texted you last night at midnight. How come you didn't answer? Is your 14-year-old daughter supposed to say, well, researchers have found that sleep deprivation in adolescence is a major risk factor in the etiology of depression. That's ridiculous. You can't expect a kid to talk like that. You have to allow her to say, hey, my evil parents take my phone every night at nine and they won't have it back to the next morning. This is your job. Now, this evening, when you speak to your daughter about this and you explain that you attended a webinar and Dr. Sachs advises that beginning immediately, you take the device and switch it off at nine o'clock, the very latest, and put it in the charger, and the charger from now on will be in the parent's bedroom, your daughter may not applaud. She may say, but I use my phone as my alarm clock. Let her know they still make actual alarm clocks. She can go to the store and buy one. They're not expensive. And now she may really protest. She may say, but what if there's an emergency? Remind her that you still have a house phone, a landline in the parent's bedroom, If there's a true emergency, her friend is welcome to call and you, the parent, will pick up and you, the parent, will decide whether this emergency warrants waking her up at two in the morning or not. It probably doesn't. It can probably wait. This has to be your call. No devices in the bedroom. No cell phones in the bedroom. That's not just my advice. Those are the official guidelines of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And the link to the full text of the AAP guidelines is in your handout, which advise no unsupervised use of the internet, no expectation of privacy when a child or teenager under 18 is online. So the device should be in a public space like the kitchen or the living room. Scholars define sexting as sending or receiving an obscene photo. They define obscene as the nipple of the female breast is exposed or the male or female genitalia is exposed. Sexting is rare. But what has become very common is what, excuse me, some scholars call not quite sexting. Girls posing in bikinis or uh, bra and panties and posting those pictures online. That has become very common. So as I mentioned, I believe I've done nine different presentations for the Islamic Association of Greater Detroit. At one of these, um, Dr. Ustra Hamzavi was in attendance and she and I spoke at length afterwards. And she told me how often parents in her practice will say, oh, well, my daughter would never do that. I mean. Dr. Sachs is not Muslim. He's talking about his experience. My daughter would never do that. My daughter wears a head covering. She's very devout. She, my daughter is not at risk. And Dr. Hamzavi wrote these words for this presentation and has asked me to read these words to you. Dr. Asra Hamzavi wants you to know that the Islamic community is not exempt from these issues. Young people are not safeguarded just because they are Muslim. Parents must be knowledgeable and vigilant. So then it was back. 
in Farmington Hills or Novi or one of those towns northwest of Detroit at the invitation of the Islamic Association of Greater Detroit. And it happened again. Another Muslim psychiatrist came up to me. And again, we had a long talk. And again, she said that her parents, the parents of her, the kids in her practice think they're blindsided. They thought that because their kids were Muslim, they were protected. And she also asked me to read to you this sentence, which she wrote. She wants you to know, quote, being Muslim does not protect your child from American culture. End quote. That is her experience in the affluent suburbs of Detroit. Parents must be aware and protect their children. So I visited a very fine K through 12 private school. 12 year old girl had a 14 year old boyfriend. He asked her to send him some photos, nothing obscene. He just wanted to see her take off her blouse and skirt to reveal bra and panties. Of course, she knew her parents would never allow this. So she went into her bedroom, closed the door, locked the door and took the pictures he had requested and sent them via Snapchat. Snapchat claims that you can send a photo using, say, a five second self-destruct on their app. And after the recipient has looked at the photo for five seconds, it will vanish. And if they try to save it using a screenshot, you, the sender, will be notified. Snapchat is lying. Snapchat knows that there are dozens of free apps out there that will allow you to capture any photo, any video sent via Snapchat without the sender being notified. This girl didn't know that. The boy sent all the photos, uh, saved all the photos. She didn't know. He had one of those apps installed, of course. School administrators later determined he did not intend to share the photos, but he was at a party. And he set his phone down on a table to grab some chips and talk to some friends. He had his back to his phone. Another boy came over, found the phone. The lock screen had not yet engaged. Boy scrolled over to the gallery, found this girl's photos, forwarded each one of those photos to his own phone, exited the gallery, went back to the home screen, put the phone down exactly where he'd found it, First boy didn't know anything had happened. Second boy then posted all the photos to his own Instagram. Within three days, basically everybody at the school had seen them. Boys, this girl didn't even know, were coming up to her and saying, hey, Emily, how about you put on a striptease for us? She had been invited to a three-day ski weekend the birthday girl, the girl who was hosting the ski trip, whose parents were hosting the ski trip, whose parents were paying for the bus bus to drive the girls to the mountain, paying for lodging at uh, the mountain, paying for lift tickets. The birthday girl called up this girl and said, I hate to make this phone call, but my mom is totally freaking out because all the other moms are freaking out. And they're saying, they're telling my mom that if you're going to be there, they won't let their daughter come because they now think you're some kind of bad influence. So I have to uninvite you. I'm really sorry. I have to uninvite you. This girl had no psychiatric history. She collapsed. Hysterical sobbing. Started cutting herself with razor blades. Saying her life was over. The photos would always be out there, which was absolutely true and is true, I'm told. Uh, the school administrators got the boy to take him down, but by then 20 other boys or men, we have no idea, had reposted them. I'm told they're still out there on anonymous, untraceable websites. You'll never get them down. They will always be out there with her name on them, her real name. So they took, the parents took their daughter to the doctor. He diagnosed depression, prescribed Lexapro, 10 milligram, and counseling psychotherapy. That accomplished nothing. So you now have a 12-year-old girl with no history of depression who is now 
severely depressed, refusing to go to school, wants to die, cutting herself with razor blades. Who's at fault? The girl? Her boyfriend? The other boy? No, they're kids. The parents are to blame. Look, this, this cell phone is a very powerful device. With this device, I can take a photo and send a photo. And once I've sent it, I have no control over who sees it or what's done with it. That's a very grown-up functionality. If you're going to put a device like that in the hands of a child, then you, the parent, are responsible for every photo they take, every photo they send, every photo they receive. So I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal sharing this story and making this point. Based on the research, at what age is it appropriate for a kid to have a smartphone? Certainly no child under 13 should have such a phone, and most 13-year-olds are not ready. But regardless, if you're going to give your kid a smartphone, a phone that can send a photo, then you must install parental monitoring software that will show you the photo before they even do anything with it. And explain to your kid, look, I will see every photo you take before you even do anything with it on the dashboard on my phone and my laptop. And if I see anything inappropriate, you lose the device indefinitely. You must install parental monitoring software on your kids' devices and explain. Or there is another option, choose a basic phone. A phone which can make a phone call, receive a phone call, but cannot surf the web, cannot post a photograph to social media. In the United States, the two big, uh, two most popular basic phones, one is called Pinwheel, the other is called Gab. I'm not going to endorse one or the other. I've heard, as far as I'm concerned, the differences between them are not large. They are both basic phones. Researcher at Northwestern just outside Chicago, ask girls, why are you doing this? Boys are asking you for these photos where you're undressed or partially dressed. Why, why do you say yes? Why do you do it? And the girls said, well, all the other girls are doing it and they don't know how or why to say no. They have received no instruction. On the contrary, they're immersed in the world of contemporary American popular culture. The world of WAP, Megan Thee Stallion and Bruno Mars, which shows that that's what cool girls do. What is a girl supposed to say when a boy says, I want you to take a picture undressing and send it to me? What is she supposed to say? I'm a lady of virtue? No, that doesn't work. You have to allow her to say, hey, my evil parents have installed this app on my phone. They'll see every picture I take as soon as I take it. And I'll lose my phone if I do anything inappropriate. That makes it a lot easier. But American parents push back. And before the pandemic, I was doing one of these presentations. And during question and answer, mother said, I don't want to violate my daughter's privacy. If she doesn't want me to see her photos, then I won't see them. I don't want to see them. If she doesn't want me to see them, that's fine. I believe in privacy. I don't want to violate my daughter's privacy by seeing every picture she takes. I said to this mother, look, the most important thing you must teach your daughter or your son for that matter is that there is no such thing as privacy to any photo that you send with a device. Privacy is great. You want to share a photo privately? Here's how you do it. You print it out on a piece of photo paper. You take it over to your friend's house, you show it to them, and then you shred it. That's privacy. There is no privacy to any photo that you share electronically. Again, many American parents are very reluctant to install parental monitoring apps. You must do so for three reasons. First of all, to prevent inappropriate use so that your kid is not taking photos they shouldn't be taking. Second, to limit excessive time. And to limit exposure to popular culture. And that's why I began this afternoon as I did by showing some of the most toxic elements of American popular culture. And that's not cherry picking. Those were number one hit songs in this country. 
that are typical of American popular culture. You don't want your kid immersed in that culture. But American parents are so confused. So many of them want to be their kid's best friend. But a friend is a peer. A friend cannot command. A friend cannot say, I will not allow you to pig out on ice cream right before supper time. Only a parent can do that. A friend cannot say, I will not allow you to listen to that song. Only a parent can do that. A friend cannot say, I'm taking your device from you at nine o'clock so you can get a decent night's sleep. Only a parent can do that. There's any number of kids out there who can be your kid's best friend. None of them can do the job of the parent. That's your job. You must install parental monitoring apps on your kid's devices and explain the rules and consequences to your daughter and to your son. Effective parenting begins with the quality of the parent-child relationship. You must make time to do fun things with your child. Again, a lot of parents, when I say it's not your job to be your kid's best friend, they misunderstand. They think I'm saying you shouldn't have, do fun things with your kid. You must do fun things with your kid. That's where effective parenting begins. So let me tell you a story from my own medical practice. Mom and dad were divorced. The judge awarded mom 100% custody. Dad had no right of visitation because dad had been convicted and had served a brief time in jail for selling drugs. So the judge had disqualified him from any role. Mom had 100% custody. Then mom got arrested and convicted and sent to jail for selling drugs. And the social worker called dad and said, uh, you're the only family this boy has uh, that we know of, period. And uh, if you don't want him, he's going into foster care. But the judge says that you now have 100% custody because the mom is going to be incarcerated. So dad said, of course I want him. Absolutely I want him. So the social worker brought this boy to dad this eight-year-old boy who hadn't even seen dad in several years and who'd been taught by mom that dad was an evil, nasty, horrible person. And dad tried to break through, wasn't successful, but then said, you know what? We're going tubing. We're going to the mountain, Allentown, an hour north of here. We're going to the mountain, Blue Mountain. We're going to go tubing. And the son said, I hate tubing. <laughs> and dad said, you have never gone tubing. And he said, well, I'd, I know I will hate it. I don't want to do it. The son didn't want to do anything with his father. Dad insisted, you're going. Straps him in the car seat. Son didn't talk the whole way. But when he got to the mountain, he changed. And within minutes, he was laughing and having fun with his father. And that father told me that that day was the turning point when his son learned that it was possible to have fun with dad, that maybe dad wasn't the evil monster that mom had portrayed him as. And once the fun is there, the relationship becomes loving. And once the relationship is loving, parenting is easy because your kid doesn't want to let you down, doesn't want to disappoint you. You must prioritize time to have fun with your kid. And I devote a chapter of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, to the importance of this and how to do it. And again, a lot of American parents are confused. They think that doing homework with their kid counts. It doesn't count. Yeah, do homework with your kid. But you must also prioritize time to have fun with your kid. So that's Blue Mountain, where this father took his son tubing. Or cooking together. Or making music together. Or target shooting. Whatever, whatever you love. Share that with your kid. Could be golf. Could be hiking. Could be biking. That's a selfie uh, my daughter and I took after we did a 20 mile. Went for a shorter bike ride this morning doing fun stuff together. Again, American parents are so confused. 
It is so common to find American parents who say things like, I just want her to be happy. I just want her to be happy. For 18 years, I was an attending physician at Shady Grove Hospital in Montgomery County, Maryland, where I practiced. One night I got a phone call in the middle of the night from the ER, but they didn't want me to admit a patient. They were calling about a teenage girl who I'd known for many years since she was very little. And she was uh, 15 years old at the time of the phone call. She had been a victim of sexual assault. And mom was hysterical. And mom had asked the ER doctor to call me because she didn't know anybody there. And she was very upset about what had happened to her daughter. And that's why they were calling me, not to admit anyone, but just to come and talk to mom. So I did. I met her in the consultation room adjacent to the ER. The exam was concluding on her daughter, forensic exam. And I walked into the room to talk to mom. And when I walked into the room, the first thing mom said, it was just her and me. Mom said, I knew I shouldn't have let her go. It was a frat party at the college. She's 15 years old. I knew I shouldn't have let her go. And of course you want to shake mom and say, well, then why'd you let her go? But I didn't do that because I already knew the answer. She wanted to be her daughter's best friend and a best friend cannot say no. A friend cannot command. I just want her to be happy. Her daughter had assured her they'd be safe. They she'd stay with her other friends. I just wanted to be happy. I was talking to a mom in Tampa, Florida, when I was speaking at a school down there. And I shared this story. And this other mom told me how she had a somewhat similar experience with her daughter, 14 years old. Her 14-year-old uh, announced one day, the 14-year-old came up to her and said, hey, guess what? We're all going to Cancun for spring break. And mom looked at her phone. She said, spring, I can't get away. I'm busy that week. I can't get away. And her daughter said, I didn't say you were going. We're going. Me and the other girls, we're going to Cancun for spring break. And her mom said, but you're 14 years old. You're going to go to Cancun with a bunch of 14-year-olds? I don't think it's safe. And her daughter said, oh, it's totally safe. We'll stay together. We'll have our phones. We're fine. And mom said, I don't think so. Um, Cancun, that's where American college men go for spring break. And you're 14, but you could easily pass for 18. And I don't think a drunk young man is going to stop and ask for ID. I don't think it's safe. And her daughter said, it's totally safe. We'll be fine. And her daughter, her mom said, I'm sorry, you're not going. And mom told me her daughter exploded, started screaming at her, saying, I hate you. I hate you. You're going to like totally ruin my whole life. And mom responded, mom said, well, to be honest, sometimes I'm not so fond of you either. She said, but I am your mother and that's a job. Like any job, it has a job description. Item one in my job description is I have to keep you safe. And I know more than you do about the behavior of drunk young men. And you're not going. If you're doing the right thing as a parent, there will be times that your daughter will say, I hate you. I never want to talk to you again. It may happen. Your job is not to be the best friend. Your job is to be the parent. Those are not the same jobs. The key to happiness is humility. Many Americans misunderstand humility. American culture tells kids to walk tall and stand proud. So I was meeting with middle school kids, and this was at a Christian school that bills itself as a, you know, evangelical Christian school, teach the Bible. I meet with middle school kids at this students, and I asked them, what is humility? Raise your hand if you think you know what the word humility means. And a boy shot up his hand and I called on him and he said, humility means trying to convince yourself you're dumb when you know you're smart. 
I said, actually, that is not humility. That is psychosis. That is a de detachment from reality. But I'm not blaming this boy. How should he know? He has received no instruction. This school claims to be an evangelical Christian school, and humility is a, is a Christian virtue, and yet the kids have learned nothing. Nothing about humility. Nothing. I suggest to these kids that a better definition of humility is, be, is being as interested in other people as you are in yourself. And the kids are all giving me a blank look. They have never heard this before. They have received no instruction in the virtue of humility. So that's Justin Bieber, uh, American pop idol, had a big hit song where he sang, I'm going to light up the sky like lightning and this world will belong to me. I was born to stand tall and this world will belong to me. Uh, not exactly humility, but this is very characteristic of American culture. What is humility? The parents don't know. So during Q&A at another one of these talks, mother said, I don't want to teach my daughter to be humble. I don't want her to be humble. I want her to have high self-esteem. So when that big job comes along, she'll go for it. I don't want her to be humble. I said, Mom, with all due respect, you are confused. You're confusing being humble with being timid. Those are not the same things. They're very nearly opposites. And the virtue you want for your daughter is not high self-esteem. The virtue you are thinking of, mom, is courage. Courage. Courage means that you know your weaknesses, your shortcomings, your inadequacies, and you find the strength to push forward anyhow. You want to teach courage. How to teach humility? Well, it begins with household chores. But I tell you, I've spoken on this topic in West County, in town and country, in Chesterfield, and I can tell you about parents in West County who have said to me, I could name specific schools. I'm not going to do that. I can tell you about schools I've spoken at in West, West County where parents have said, oh, you know, my kid's so busy with school and computer clothing class after school and soccer after school and all her homework. You know, her job is school. Her job is school. And we can, you know, we're West County. We've got money. We can afford to hire. They don't say it like that. We can afford to hire someone to make the bed and vacuum and, and clean house. My, my daughter's job is school. And the unintended message they're sending is that you are too important to be bothered making your bed or keeping your room tidy or vacuuming. You're not teaching humility. You're teaching the opposite of humility. And American schools are often utterly clueless on this point. So I was visiting an American school, third grade classroom. The assignment in the third grade classroom was to write your name on a white piece of paper and attach to your name five adjectives describing how amazing you are. That's the assignment. So Mateo here has written a genius, misspelled, excellent, misspelled, talented, awesome, and marvelous. I'm not picking on Mateo. He's just doing the assignment. There's no awareness on the part of the school how indoctrinating kids into their own awesomeness leads to bloated self-esteem. And bloated self-esteem leads to narcissism. Telling kids how special you are leads empirically to kids who think they're more special than anyone else. And it also leads to resentment. And I have seen this as a family doctor. The girl who at age 15 is praised by her teachers. As, this girl wrote this short story, a pretty good short story. Her teacher wrote on the top of it, A plus, you have a spark of the divine fire. That's high praise. <laughs> well, I can tell you 10 years later, that girl is resentful. She's written two novels and she can't get them published, can't get an agent. She's so great. How come she's working for a low wage in a cubicle? Researchers at UCLA looked at the most popular TV shows marketed to children and teens. 
1967, 77, 87, 97, and 2007. And they found great consistency, 1967 through 1997. What is the show teaching, this most popular TV show? Whether it's the Andy Griffith Show in 1967, Happy Days in 1977, Family Ties in 1987, or Sabrina the Teenage Witch in 1997, they're all teaching the number one most important thing is to do the right thing, even if it hurts. Do the right thing. Be a good friend. But in 10 years, between 1997 and 2007, they found American culture flipped upside down. They ranked these shows on 16 parameters. From 1967 through 1997, being rich and being famous was right at the bottom. But in 2007, suddenly being famous had gone from number 16 to number one. The most popular shows of 2007, like Survivor, American Idol, or iCarly, it's all about winning. Doing the right thing, that's going to get you voted off the island. And other research suggests it's only gotten worse since 2007. They concluded that American popular culture is now a cult of fame and wealth. This was not true 30 years ago or 50 years ago, but it is true today. It is a cult of fame and wealth. The new cult of fame and wealth did not originate with Justin Bieber or Bruno Mars, but they embody it, they celebrate it, and they promote it. So Bruno Mars had another video that's had over 1.2 billion views where he wants you to know that he's got his own private jet and shows him enjoying all of his luxuries, his limousines, his private jet. He's a winner in this contemporary American culture because he is wealthy and famous. But what if you're not? If you are not wealthy and famous, then you are a loser. That's the lesson of contemporary American culture. Social media, as it is actually used by American teens, is about broadcasting me. Here I am shopping. Here I am at the game. Here I am in my bedroom and seeing where you rank relative to everybody else. One of the most robust equations in human psychology is happiness equals reality minus expectations. Happiness equals reality minus expectations. If your expectations are low, then happiness will be positive. But if you expect to be the next Jojo Siwa and to have 20 million followers on Instagram and to have your video go viral, your happiness is likely to be negative. Being humble leads to being happy. Being proud, bloated self-esteem leads to miserable, frustrated, envious, and resentful feelings. This is not a sermon. Again, this is a robust empirical finding. I cite these studies in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, Longitudinal Cohort Studies. What really matters? What should our top priority be? as parents. You know, until fairly recently, the answer to that question might have been a guess or a matter of opinion, but we now have longitudinal cohort studies that allow us to give an evidence-based answer to that question. What should our highest priority be as parents raising our kids? Longitudinal cohort studies where you follow kids from birth through adolescence into adulthood beyond 30 years of age. Huge studies going on for decades, but we now have many of them. And these studies allow us to answer the question, what characteristic in a child, sorry about that, what, char what characteristic in a child that I can influence best predicts good outcomes in adulthood? Outcomes such as having a job rather than being involuntarily unemployed, being in good health, not being addicted to drugs or alcohol, not being convicted of a felony. And they look at all these outcomes. What grades you earn in school accounts for very little of the variance. Virtue and character are what counts. Character meaning self-control as measured at 12 years of age, self-control and conscientiousness. 
How do you measure self-control in a 12 year old? It's very simple. You don't talk to the kid at all. You don't do a marshmallow test. You ask, can this kid wait their turn? Can they listen to grownups and to peers? Low self-control. Low self-control measured at age 12. Predict a high risk of poor physical health in that individual 20 years later and a high risk of addiction, substance abuse. Low self-control at age 12 predicted a high risk of financial struggles in that individual 20 years later. High self-control at age 12 predicted a low risk of financial struggles 20 years later. Low self-control at age 12 predicts a low credit rating in that individual 20 years later. High self-control at age 12 predicts a high credit rating 20 years later. What really matters? What should our highest priority be in raising our kid? It should be to teach virtue and character. That's not a sermon. It is a robust empirical finding. I devote two chapters of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, to reviewing every relevant longitudinal cohort study addressing this question. And every one of them comes to the same conclusion. And the funny thing is that American parents used to teach that. American parents used to say things like, I'd rather you get a C on the test honestly than cheat and get an A. But I can tell you that American parents are now much more likely to say something like, hey, you want to get into Stanford? You want to get into MIT? You got to have amazing grades because you're not just competing against American kids anymore. You're competing against kids from East Asia and Europe. You got to have amazing grades. And there has been an explosion in cheating among American kids over the last 20 years. Remember when I showed you that question at the beginning, which we're going to return to in just a moment? What characteristic of a child at age 12 best predicts health, wealth, and happiness 20 years later? One of those choices was grades at school. I can tell you, nobody ever raises their hand. Parents know, they've heard the research. They know that grades at school at age 12 do not predict health, wealth, and happiness 20 years later, but they act as if it did. American parents now act as if doing well in school is the most important thing, more important than honesty. More important than honesty. I see American parents who help their kids cheat. That's not unusual anymore. What characteristic of a child measured at 12 years of age powerfully and accurately predicts health and wealth and happiness in that individual 20 years later? It is self-control and other measures of conscientiousness like honesty. Psychologists have known for many years that every human personality can be mapped on a five-dimensional space. The five dimensions of human personality are conscientiousness and its subtraits of self-control and honesty openness to new ideas, friendliness and agreeableness, emotional stability, and extroversion, introversion. Some elements of human personality are difficult to change, notably extroversion, introversion. And personality does become more fixed as we age, but even young adults can change significantly on some traits. And it turns out that self-control and honesty are very amenable to change. They are not innate. They are not inherited. They must be taught. You must teach them. How do you teach self-control to a 12-year-old? You begin by saying no dessert until you eat your vegetables. No games until all the chores are done and all the homework is done. And if that has not been the policy in your home, I encourage you to make it the policy in your home. And if that has not been the policy in your home, I advise you to sit your kid down and say, hey, we've been doing some things wrong. We're going to make some changes. No dessert until you eat your vegetables. No games until all the chores are done and all the homework is done. No video game consoles in the bedroom. And if that has not been the policy and you make that announcement, there will be an explosion. And the older the child, the louder and longer the explosion. But if both parents, if both parents stand their ground, 
after six weeks, not after one day or one week, but after six weeks, six weeks, you will have a child with better self-control. And in almost every case, a happier child as well. So that's your job. Your job is to teach virtue. Your first job as a parent is to teach virtue. But that requires that you teach from a position of authority. If you're talking to your kid about not cheating on a test and say, you know, I personally, I don't think I'd cheat on a test because that's just not my thing. But, you know, you do you, whatever floats your boat. You're not teaching anything. I have been a doctor in the United States for 35 years. I have witnessed what I've come to call the collapse of American parenting. As recently as 20 years ago, it was common to find American parents who would say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's not a suggestion, that is a command. But over the last 20 years, I have seen that command soften, morph into a question. And the question is often something like, well, you know, how would you feel if someone did that to you? And the parent has no idea what to say when her son responds, if someone did that to me, I'd kick him in the nuts and then I'd sit on his face. Regular columnist for the New York Times wrote a column on enlightened parenting. In her opinion, enlightened parenting means, and I quote, setting your child free to discover themselves their own right and wrong. And if in so doing, your child becomes a stranger to you, then so be it. That may seem enlightened, but it is not enlightened. It is a dereliction of duty. If you set your child free to discover for themselves their own right and wrong, and they live in the United States and they have internet access and they speak English, what they will discover is Bruno Mars, WAP, mainstream pornography, it's not going to be good. Look, what is childhood for? Literally, what is childhood for? A four-year-old horse is a mature adult. And a horse is a bigger animal than a human. So it can't just be about physical maturation because a horse is bigger than a human and a horse is mature at age four. A four-year-old human has barely begun. Why? Humans are ch uh, children or adolescents for more years than most animals live. Why? We don't have to guess. We have scholars like Dr. Melvin Connor at Emory who have studied this question, and I cite them. And what the scholars have found is that human childhood takes many, many years because it takes many years for parents to teach the child right and wrong. That is a defining characteristic of our species. New York Times recommendation to set your child loose to find their own right and wrong is not only an abdication of parental responsibility, it is profoundly unhuman. It's not what we do. It's not what is in our DNA. So Dr. Sack, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. It's already four o'clock and I've gotten a lot of messages on both YouTube and on my phone from people whose message is so long, the YouTube won't take it. <laughs> um, you've had a lot of positive feedback. Uh, some people are scared now, and I don't blame them. After reading your book, I got very scared and worried. Um, so a lot of what you've said does apply to all our children, and I've seen it in our community as well, where people tell me, well, my daughters won't do that, and I know for a fact their daughters are doing that. And so it's very much eye-opening for our community to learn that the problems that Western culture has are the same problems we're going to have, if not already had, and that, you know, this needs to be something that we learn. And people who are first generation and second generation differ in their, uh, you know, rearing because they don't understand the technology. They don't understand high schools. They don't understand how the, the whole system works. They're used to the village helping, and now it's just them and the kids. And now the village is replaced with their peers which makes it very difficult um, to compete. And peers are a lot more fun. So how, do you, how would you like to take the questions? Do you want me to just start by? Well, <laughs> I hope you will allow me to, I just, we're almost done. And I would just like to get through the last few slides, which have my last recommendations. If you just give me a couple, a few minutes here, 
we will wrap up and then we can do your questions. But let me just wrap up my title slides here. The real hazard of American culture, uh, the culture of whatever floats your boat is that it undermines self-control, disrespects parental authority. So you must bridge the generations. So uh, Frank Algar and his colleagues interviewed more than 10,000 adolescents coast to coast and asked them in the last seven days, how many evening meals have you had at home with a parent, at least one parent, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, and then quantified for each of these kids internalizing problems like anxiety, depression, positive well-being, and life satisfaction, and found a huge effect, not just going from zero to seven, but at almost every step along the way. If you compare five evening meals at home with a parent to six, going from five to six, you see a significant decrease in internalizing problems, a significant increase in positive well-being and life satisfaction. And yet what has happened? A huge decline in the number of kids having a meal at home with a parent. My wife and I went to buy a new car. Uh, when the salesman found out we had a teenage daughter, wanted to sell us the rear seat entertainment system and handed us this flyer the two kids are looking at the screen with headphones on. Mom is smiling, looking back at them as if to say, hey, this is great. We can drive to Chicago, never have to talk to my kids at all. Time in the car is special. It's private time. No earbuds, no headsets in the car. When you're in the car, you should be listening to your kid and she should be listening to you, not to Bruno Mars or Megan Thee Stallion. Uh, nothing in the bedroom except a bed, no TV in the bedroom. Uh, uh, this is our family room, our uh, TV in the upper right hand corner. My uh, we invited my parent, my wife's parents to move in with us. My parents are dead. They've lived with us now for 13 years. My father in law, my mother in law, my wife, my daughter, one family room. That's where you spend your time. We got a big backyard. We do a lot of uh, gardening and planting uh, board games. There's our group selfie. Uh, American parents think they have to choose between the, being the tiger mom pushing kids to achieve or the Irish setter dad who just wants kids to be happy, but both are mistaken. Last chapter of my book is the meaning of life. You must instill a sense of what we are here for. That's more about more than where you go to college or how much money you make. Because without that bigger context, working hard to get a good mark just becomes a race to nowhere, to borrow the title of a uh, documentary making that point and the result is anxiety and depression but being the Irish setter dad letting kids whatever they want do whatever they want doesn't work unless you first educate desire we'll skip this in the interest of time the question I opened with why are American kids today so much more likely to be anxious depressed or disengaged than American kids 20 years ago or than kids uh, in other countries right now uh, like Germany Switzerland or New Zealand and what can we do about it? Here are my answers. The bonds across generations have been broken. You must restore them. You must fight for supper together. Uh, cancel the play date, make a family date instead. Uh, turn off the screens, limit, govern, and guide social media and video games as per the guidelines that I provided in your handout. American culture is now a cult of fame and wealth. You must challenge that. Many American kids think that professional success is the key to happiness. They learn that from American culture and it's a lie. It's not true. It's not empirically valid. Humility leads to happiness. Again, a lot more in the uh, books, translations are available, uh, other presentations. And there's the handout. The handout is online. It's mynamelenardsacks.com slash parenting.pdf. It is case sensitive. It is all lowercase, and you must include the www and the .pdf. Thank you <laughs> for letting me uh, finish with those additional tips about uh, television and um, no earbuds, no headsets in the car, etc. So now, indeed, let's turn to questions. If you just want to read me questions that uh, you have, because I cannot see those questions online. Okay. Uh, one question I had in your presentation, you said that it's translated into all those languages. Is Arabic happen to be one of the languages or no? No, uh, my book, my books have been translated into these eight languages. Okay, that's it. Well, hopefully that will come in the future. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the questions I got is, uh, let's see. 
trying to move my face off of this thing. Oh, okay. If a parent is too strict, kids can go the other direction and have a disdain for their parents for sheltering them from popular songs, cartoons, etc. So what do you think of people who think strictness is... Yes. So I devote a chapter of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, to answering uh, questions like that. And I begin that chapter with that very question, with a parent who said, if I follow your advice and I'm the strict parent and I don't, and I insist that my kid only listen to good music and not listen to the most popular American songs and well, then they'll go to university. They'll go away to college and, and I won't be there anymore to chaperone them. And, and, um, uh, won't they rebound? Uh, won't they, uh, uh, not only hate me, but they'll, they'll go the other, uh, to the other extreme because, because I have sheltered them. Um, so I begin that my response to that question with a, uh, a young woman, uh, her name is Marlo Phillips. That's her real name. And, um, uh, her parents were strict and uh, they would not allow her to go on a date without a chaperone. And she's a very beautiful young woman. She had many boys who wanted to date her, but she was not allowed to go out on a date without an adult present at all times. She was never allowed to be alone with a boy period, no matter what. Uh, and she was just furious. She said, this is child abuse. I'm going to call Child Protective Services. And her mom said, okay, here's the phone. And Marla said to her parents, I'm going to have to be in therapy for the rest of my life because of the way you are abusing me. And uh, she was not allowed to see R-rated movies. She was not allowed to listen to uh, the, the most popular American songs, many of them. Uh, and she was furious with her parents throughout most of high school, actually, is what she told me. And I quote her by name in the book with her permission. Then she went to the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. She was not allowed to have social media, incidentally. She didn't have an Instagram account. Then she went to the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. And she told me at the beginning of her sophomore year, her second year at UVA, she had this epiphany. She suddenly realized, oh my gosh. I'm the only girl here who's not going to have to be in therapy for the rest of my life because of the way my parents raised me. She told me about these other young women at University of Virginia who are asking her, asking Marlo, uh, what do you think of this Instagram post? Do you think it's too skanky or maybe not skanky enough? Do you think I'm giving oral sex to, the, to enough boys or, or maybe not enough boys? And Marlo wants to shake these young women and say to them, get a life. Do you have no conception of yourself that is separate from what the boys think of you? It's pathetic, but that's what you get with American culture. There's a, an important line in the book of Proverbs in the Bible that says, if you raise up a child in the way they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Well, is that true? No, it's not true, actually. Um, empirically speaking, but we can, we can, we can tweak that. We can change that line in the book of Proverbs uh, just a little bit in a way that will make it true. Let's revise it as follows. Let's write, if you raise up a child in the way they should go, you have improved the odds. There are no guarantees, but if at 14, 15, 16 years of age, your kid has not developed the habit of spending hours a day on social media, has not developed a fondness for the hip hop that is the most popular music in the United States, has not developed the habit of spending hours a day on uh, video games, you've improved the odds that when they get to university, they will, uh, continue on the right path as Marlo Phillips did on the, but conversely, if you say, well, I think good parenting means letting kids decide because that's what the New York times said. And you allow your kids to develop a fondness for this music, which is very catchy. There's a reason these songs are the number one hit songs. Musically, they're very entertaining 
and all the other kids are listening to them. They've got a great beat. And your kid starts listening to this and enjoying this and preferring this and spending time on social media or video games or both. What are the odds that when they go to university, they're going to say, well, now that I'm at university, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to cut back on the social media and the video games. I'm going to start listening to Mozart instead of Bruno Mars. The odds of that happening are very low. You have to have courage. The original title of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, the original title of that book was The Collapse of American Parenting. And the subtitle was Why Most Kids Would Now Be Better Off Raised Outside of North America. And I included a lot more detail about the South Island of New Zealand and Scotland outside of Edinburgh and Glasgow and German-speaking Switzerland, showing that kids raised there do much, much, much better than kids raised here because it's a different culture. And it's a culture that's much healthier for kids. A culture that in many ways looks like the culture, some aspects of the United States culture in the 1960s, by which I mean not racist or sexist or xenophobic. I mean strong bonds between parents and kids. I mean kids respect their parents. Uh, but the fact, but my publisher vetoed that, you know, non-celebrity authors don't get to choose their title. And they don't even get to write exactly the book they want to write. If you want to get your book published by a major publisher, they have to approve it. And so we dropped all that stuff about New Zealand and Scotland and German speaking Switzerland. There's a little bit, but not much. Um, because as my publisher pointed out, and I think she had a point, you and I are not moving to New Zealand or Scotland or Switzerland. It's not going to happen. We're going to live here. So the question we have to answer is if we're going to live here, we're going to speak English in this country and our kids are going to speak English in this country. How can we improve the odds for our kids? And my answer is you're going to have to do di things differently than the parents living next door because the parents living next door, they're American parents and they're raising their kids in a way that's look, American kids are now 40 times more likely than kids in Germany to have bipolar disorder. 90 times more likely than kids in Italy to be on medication like Risperdal, Zyprexa, or Seroquel, prescribed for uh, major psychiatric disorders. 14 times more likely than kids in the United Kingdom to be diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. American parenting is not working, objectively. American kids are now many times more likely to be anxious, depressed, or disengaged compared to kids raised in Scotland, in Switzerland, in New Zealand. Um, so you're going to have to do things differently. And it takes a lot of courage to say no, but that is your job as a parent. Okay. That's, it sounds wonderful. Um, one thing I wanted to add that the Middle East and other Southeast Asia and other predominantly Muslim countries are unfortunately learning from the West, from famous shows on Netflix and all these other um, social media uh, applications that some of the behaviors that we have somehow contribute to the success of America. And, you know, some of those people may have low self-esteem or are still colonized in their minds. And I find that uh, last time I went to the Middle East, you know, a lot of imitation. And I hope programs like yours can, you know, go through and, and, and be distributed to the Middle East and Southeast Asia and let them realize that Americans are actually suffering from this behavior and from this culture. It's not something that's making this country any better. Um, yeah. uh, well, I have not spoken in, in uh, the Middle East or Southeast Asia, but I have spoken on many occasions in Australia, New Zealand, Scotland, and Switzerland. And I've been asked to speak there in part because uh, the hosts like to hear from an American saying, hey, you need to protect your kids from American culture. Yeah. American culture is now the toxic culture that is indeed spreading um, worldwide. And, uh, you know, when you get off the plane in Sydney and all the magazines are about Brad and Angelina, it's, it's very discouraging. Uh, but uh, we now have good research uh, sh showing that uh, in Australia, in Scotland, to the extent that kids can be protected from American culture, they do better. Uh, in, in Scotland, and certainly in German-speaking Switzerland, they still recognize American culture as a foreign import, and they can try to block it out. It's harder for us in this country because this 
American culture is not a foreign import. import. It's our homegrown American English speaking culture. But especially in cultures where uh, this first language is German or uh, Spanish, it's a little easier to block out the toxicity. But as you said, the toxicity is spreading. It's a virus which is spreading. Uh, and, I, and that's another reason my uh, publisher gave for vetoing my title, The Collapse of American Parenting, because she pointed out, as I knew, that, that this is spreading and that what I'm calling American parenting is um, global. Is global, is becoming global, for sure. So I have another long question, and it's in the same relation to the other question. Um, he said, are you aware of ongoing research for the potential long-term harmful effects of sheltering your kids? Uh, we see children grow up to rebel against their families, commit crimes, and engage in much more harmful activities than Roblox and social media. Uh, is there evidence that you are aware of regarding this? Yeah. You said that so parenting hasn't changed, but the culture unf unfortunately changed. Although I do yeah. think you said parenting has changed along with the culture. People aren't parenting the same way. Okay, um, so we need to introduce the terms authoritarian, authoritative, and permissive. Okay. So Diana Baumrind uh, died not long ago. She spent her entire life, and she lived a long time, studying families. And again, her her students and she would go into homes and observe how parents were raising their kids and then follow these kids for 20, 30, 40 years to see how did parenting style influence outcomes decades later. Um, and she came up with these terms, authoritarian, authoritative, and permissive, which authoritarian and authoritative sound similar, but they're very different parenting styles. So I don't use those terms. I, Instead of authoritarian, I talk about too hard. Instead of permissive, I talk about too soft. Instead of authoritative, I talk about just right. Those are the terms I introduce uh, to make uh, Diana Baumrin's concepts a little more accessible. So most of my talk today was about the dangers of permissive parenting, of letting kids call the shots, letting kids listen to whatever music they wanna listen to and do whatever they want to on social media or video games. That's harmful, and that has been the main focus of my talk this afternoon. You're, the person posing your question, we can restate their question as, aren't you overlooking the dangers of parenting that is too hard? You've talked about the dangers of parenting that is too soft. Is it not the case that parenting which is too hard also has bad outcomes? Yes, it does. So parenting that's too hard, authoritarian parenting, is parenting that's very rigid, rule-governed, and unloving. And we know that authoritarian parents, parents who are too hard, who are, who are uh, unbending and unloving, we know that their kids, long-term, followed 20, 30, 40 years later, are less likely to be able to sustain romantic relationships, more likely to be convicted of a violent crime. Uh, these authoritarian, uh, too hard parents are often whacking their kids using corporal punishment. Uh, so yeah, that's a problem. Why have I not talked about the dangers of too hard parenting? Because it's not a danger that most of the people attending this workshop are at seri serious risk of. C.S. Lewis has a wonderful line where he says, in most cultures, people are always warning each other about the dangers to which they are least prone. So in a permissive and indulgent culture, people warn each other about the dangers of being too strict. In a too strict culture, people are warning each other about the dangers of being too lax and indulgent. In fact, as Diana Baumrim, the great researcher herself documented in the years just before she died, American parenting has changed. Over the 40 years that she's been studying American parenting, it has become much more permissive. It has drifted from being just right parenting, which was characteristic of American parenting 30, 40 years ago, to being too soft. So again, to summarize Diana Baumram's research, 30, 40 years ago, American parents, for the most part, were doing it just right. Today, she finds in her research, or she found before her death, that American parenting has on average become too permissive. Parents are not enforcing the rules, are letting kids do whatever they want. And the result, we know from her research, kids who are raised in permissive homes, less likely to uh, uh, 
accomplish anything, uh, much more likely to become addicted to drugs or alcohol, less likely again to sustain romantic relationships. Permissive parenting leads to bad outcomes. Uh, authoritarian, too hard parenting leads to bad outcomes. Just right parenting leads to good outcomes. You don't wanna to be too hard, you don't wanna to be too soft, you wanna be just right. The reason this particular presentation has focused on the dangers of permissive parenting is because researchers find that's what most American parents are now gu guilty of. Uh, American parents has drifted. Now, sure, online and on the news, you see these horror stories of horrible parents who are whacking their kids and starving their kids. It still happens, but it's not typical. What is typical, what is now characteristic of American parents are parents who say, I just want my kid to be happy. And if she's happy doing social media and TikTok videos, what's wrong with that? And that the point of this talk was to tell you what's wrong with that. Uh, that is the temptation to which American parents are subjected. The temptation of permissive parenting. It's what the culture is teaching us. It's what the New York Times is pushing. It's what your, your neighbor is doing. And my mission this afternoon has been to warn you based on the research that permissive parenting leads to bad outcomes. Not many of us are really at serious danger of being the um, authoritarian parent, whacking our kid with uh, whips. Uh, and uh, I mean, if that's what you're doing, stop doing it. It's really harmful. But um, that's a very easy target because that's not the temptation that most of us face. Okay, so I have more questions. One thing I'd like to also say is in Islam, we, we do have the representation of the Prophet Muhammad and how he raised his children. And it never involved him hitting their, his children or speaking in a loud voice or being disrespectful towards them. And that's an example we can follow, of course, but he didn't also have the social media influences on his kids, nor did they have TikTok or Instagram. So again, it's easier said than done because of the environment that we live in today. But that is something that we live by and we try to uh, uphold. Um, and also in Ramadan, we have this, uh, which is coming up, we have this change in our behavior overall. People start to eat more together. The family gets together more often in the evening. Kids are taught self-control through the fasting. And um, I think it would be, it would behoove the parents to really get into it this, this year and teach them why Ramadan is important because of the self-control aspect of fasting, that it teaches you how to stop yourself from eating and drinking. But then there's a lot of other aspects that could be in control during that time, like speaking um, in a disrespectful way or hitting or yelling or looking at things that are um, unlawful on TV and in, in the radio and news. And a lot of Muslims stop listening to music. They listen to more Quran or traditional Islamic music during that month. So it is still something that separates us from Western culture that we have a whole month where we focus on improving our spiritual self versus just our physical and intellectual self, which we try to work on throughout the year. Um, so I just wanted to add that. So I have these other questions. Um, how do school, well, let me, let me do them in order. What are the more wholesome ways to build self-esteem and self-confidence for girls while preserving humility? So what's the best practice for that? Something happened to your sound. Maybe put the microphone. I want to question the premise of the question. Um, Self-esteem versus self-concept. Um, and we're going to get a little technical here, but I think we have to in order to answer that question. And basically, self-esteem is overrated. So researchers looking internationally find that in mathematics, American kids have the highest self-esteem. American kids are most likely to agree with the statement, I'm really smart in math. Uh, kids in South Korea and Singapore have the lowest self-esteem in math. They, they, as kids in South Korea and Singapore are most likely to say, I'm not very good at math. But kids in South Korea and Singapore blow us away in math. Kids in South Korea and Singapore do much better in math than American kids do. Uh, thinking that you're great in math, that you have high self-esteem in math, is not very useful if, in fact, you can't do math. Uh, self-esteem uh, got a big, uh, the whole self-esteem movement 
uh, really got underway in the 1970s and 1980s with studies showing that kids who were good students tended to have high self-esteem uh, academically, that kids who were doing well in math tended to regard themselves as good in math. And so this movement developed in the 70s and 80s that we should tell kids, you're really smart, you're special because you're you, in the belief that instilling high self-esteem would translate into high performance. Well, we now know that was a complete bust, that telling kids you're great and you're smart when they haven't earned it doesn't accomplish anything good. So self-esteem per se is greatly overrated. Internationally, I think we can learn a lot from countries like Singapore, where kids have very low self-esteem in math, but do very well in it. The more useful concept is a different concept, sounds the same, but it's quite different, which is self-concept. Self-concept self and self-efficacy mean I can improve, I can get better. And of course, Carol Dweck has popularized this notion of mindset, that what we really want to teach kids is not you're smart. We want to teach kids you can improve. If you work hard, you can change yourself. You don't have to remain the person you are. You can become a better person. You can become better in math. You can become a better writer. You can become a better person. So teaching self-concept and self-efficacy, I fully endorse. Teaching self-esteem, I don't think is supported by the evidence. And teaching self-concept and self-efficacy, you teach by doing. And as I say in the close of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, to become a better parent, you're gonna to have to become a better person. There is no shortcut. You cannot preach hard work and honesty if you are not working hard, if you are not honest, uh, to become a better parent, you have to become a better person. Okay. Um, another thing, I, I'm sorry to keep adding, it's just that we have this Middle Eastern perspective. Uh, I was married to someone who was raised and born uh, in the Middle East. And I realized as I grew with him, and I was born and raised here, I went to school here, that his upbringing and his schooling was authoritative and they you know probably didn't give them much of self-esteem um in the, in the way of oh you're good and you're doing so wonderful and encouragement but yet i find that people who are born and raised there and go to school in other countries have better outlook on life they don't get disappointed as much like you said um, they already have a low low threshold from their schooling um, and when they come here, they don't have as many baggage, like mental problems, as I find people who grew grew up with me. What do you in my mean high by school. a low threshold? Uh, the school doesn't expect expects very high of them, but they don't tell them that they're doing so good all the time. I myself went to school in the Middle East for a year, and I realized the difference in schooling was tremendous. Um, the teachers can be quite abusive sometimes versus how they school us here. Uh, well, but I'm certainly not going to endorse abusive no, no. teachers, which I would say is authoritarian rather than authoritative. And I'm not saying that self-esteem is always bad. If it's earned, I think it's great. If a kid has worked hard, memorized hundreds of words and wins the spelling bee, I think it's great that they have high self-esteem in spelling because they earned it. But these posters I see in American schools uh, that I've taken pictures of that I can show you that say you're great because you're you. Yeah. I don't think that's helpful. Well, what what I was getting to is when they come here and see all this positive self-esteem, they are encouraged by it and they encourage their kids and they don't realize that it's really not bringing out the best outcome either because it's so opposite to what they lived and what they experienced in Middle Eastern countries. And they have a lot of private schools now in the Middle East, but in the past they had very few. And so the public school system didn't really, it taught that the government, that you know, what we say at school is the final say, and you're not allowed to think outside that box. And when they come here, they go to the other extreme a lot of times when they see, you know, how, how friendly schools are here and how um, they try to build self-esteem, as you said, through all these um, programs and signs and, and uh, so I, that's, that was just how I was trying to express 
why they have I've also had this discussion with school leaders across the United States and around the world. Um, I am not suggesting that schools should be unfriendly. Yeah. I think schools should be warm and loving and nurturing. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have posters saying you're great because you're you. It doesn't mean that you indoctrinate kids in their own awesomeness by having them make commercials about how great they are. Uh, so I visited two schools two affluent two schools serving affluent neighborhoods both private schools within a few weeks of each other and both assigned the fourth graders to make a commercial using an ipad one school had the school make a commercial about how great i am the kid is supposed to make a commercial promoting themselves here is how great i am and this is how i'm such a great person and this is the many ways in which i am awesome and amazing Another school gave kids a list of Americans like Martin Luther King or Franklin Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln, and the kids were to make a commercial about how great this person was and what they had overcome and what they had accomplished. Of those two strategies, I think the second strategy is much wiser teach kids to look up to someone who's done something wonderful, who's done something courageous, who has exemplified a virtue. That's good. Now, both these schools are very friendly and loving and nurturing places, but telling school kids to make a commercial, puffing up them, their self-esteem about how great they are, I think will lead to bad outcomes. Whereas helping kids to really dig more deeply into the life of someone who was courageous, who was brave, and learning about them and sharing that with your peers, that I think is more likely to lead to good outcomes. So now that we're talking about schools, I have a question. How do school decisions influence outcomes? He's trying to- schools decide, what? How does school decision, which school to put your, your kid in? Oh my gosh. Decide between Islamic private school and a public school. Um, oh. It's a huge decision. It is the most consequential decision you will make in the life of your child. And again, that is evidence-based. Uh, the choice of school will determine your kid's attitude towards every subject, will determine your kid's choice of friends. If they're a teenager, it will determine their likelihood of using drugs or alcohol or engaging in sex more than any other decision you make. The choice of school is enormously consequential. So it's a very, very important choice. And uh, my wife and I moved from Maryland, from Montgomery County, Maryland, which has many schools that are regarded as great schools, but we didn't think so. We moved to uh, the Western suburbs of Philadelphia because we were unhappy with the schools uh, that were available in Montgomery County, Maryland, which means I sold my practice, we sold our house and we started over. Uh, but your kid has to be your highest priority. And if you can't find a good school, and by a good school, I mean a school that is teaching virtue, conscientiousness and honesty to your kid, then you need to move. Uh, so, um, and we enrolled our daughter at an all girls school. And I was for many years, a great proponent of all girls schools and of boys schools when they're led well and done well, which is not always the case. Um, and my daughter attended that school for nine years. And then we left because that school has taken a wrong turn. And I knew they had taken a wrong turn. For example, when the French teacher gave an assignment, which consisted of the faces of 10 American celebrities, half of whom my daughter and I did not even recognize, with the assignment to write in French about these people and what they like and what they don't like and what their favorite pastimes are. One of them was Kim Kardashian, who became famous after she promoted a sex tape she made with her ex-boyfriend. Uh, and epitomizes the culture of fame and wealth. And this is what the school is teaching and holding up as a role model. That's when we knew we had to leave and uh, enrolled instead at Delaware County Christian School. Um, so yeah, the choice of school is immensely important. 
And it has to be a very high priority for you, the parent, to figure out what's really happening at this school. If it's a private school, look at Carline. What are the kids doing when they're waiting to be picked up? If they're all looking at phones, that's a real concern. And that's a real clue that this is not a school, regardless of how many kids go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, that's the least important thing. What's important is virtue and character. And again, that's not a sermon. That's what the studies show. Uh, whether the kids go to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton does not predict health and happiness 20 years down the road. Whether they are honest and have self-control, that predicts uh, health and happiness 20 years down the road. So. Yeah, you got to really do your homework to find a good school. And by a good school, I mean a school that knows how to teach virtue and character and does it. A lot of people in our community would, you know, we have an Islamic school here and it has about, I think about 380 students total from daycare to 12th grade. And I've heard disparaging comments like, well, some of their high schoolers do just as many bad things as other high schoolers or um, you know, I'm worried that my child won't become a Harvard or a Stanford graduate if they graduate from the school. And my answer is it gives you the best outcome, number one, regardless of whether there's other children who are not upholding Islamic standards. It would give you a better outcome than if you put them in a completely un-Islamic environment. And number two, if you lose your child's spirit and soul, what does it matter if they go to Harvard or Stanford? You can't yeah. think their spirit and soul. Well, their that was that was exactly the reasoning that my wife, my daughter and I went through in our decision one year ago to move from uh, the school that she had been attending sends a great many students to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT and Stanford. Okay. And her current school sends fewer students to those uh, highly selective school. But I know that we made the right choice uh, to move to this school. Uh, Sarah, do you want to make any comment? No. <laughs> My daughter's here, and I wonder if she would uh, be willing to say anything about choosing uh, DC. You can tell us if your dad practices what he preaches, right? <laughs> uh, what do you think? Was moving to your new school a good choice? Mm -hmm. Are you happy? You that no, no, no. I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's sweet. But, uh, anyhow, this is Sarah. Hi. Hi. How are you, Sarah? Good, thank you. a lot of your pictures you look lovely oh, oh thank you <laughs> so another question i have is that the pandemic and remote learning is creating too much screen time and school moving all the homework to apps and homeworks leading kids to stay on laptops way too much and it's so hard to control all of this but i think like you said those apps that help you watch your child should really help you control that screen time as well Okay, so a couple of points. First of all, the whole screen time thing, kids learning on screens is not working. Uh, and the younger the child, the less well it's working. We can now say that with confidence because we have a great deal of evidence on that point. Yeah. Last year, I went out on a limb and I said, try to find a school. Last summer, I advised parents, try to find a school that is doing in-person learning because the whole screen thing is not working. Last summer, we didn't have the evidence that we now have. So that was quite a risky piece of advice on my point. Now, that is quite justified, though, because the risk of kids in school turns out to be quite low. Um, and uh, without a doubt, you want your kid to be in a, in a, uh, a real environment, not a virtual environment. Almost every child learns better in a real world learning situation where they are with the teacher rather than looking at a screen. And we now also know that many kids who are supposedly learning on screens are playing video games or shopping uh, when they're supposed to be on screens. Again, um, parents often don't have the time to sit and look over their kid's shoulder. If you, my wife and I both work full time and uh, uh, we're very fortunate that our daughter's school has been in-person learning um, uh, the new school. So that's good. Um, but last spring, everything was shut down. And uh, although Sarah is very motivated, most kids do not learn as well with a screen as they do in person. Um, so again, there needs to be parental monitoring software. If your kid is going to be unsupervised in front of a screen, 
There needs to be some mechanism to make sure that your kid is actually doing the Zoom and not playing a video game. And if the school will not enforce that, uh, uh, does not have a mechanism in place to make sure that the kids are really on the Zoom and not playing a video game with their device, then you need to switch to a different school. Okay. Um, with the parental monitoring devices, I, I received a message from someone who's related to me. And she said, you know, if my parents had done that to me growing up, I would have rebelled severely. And um, I'm glad my parents taught me that fearing God was more important than fearing my parents. So I think, since I know you haven't talked much about God, and I know you are a, a devout person, but in Islam, we are taught to teach that God watches us at all times, and he is the one that we should fear more than any of our parents or any of the authority in our life. And so I think having a balance of teaching the child that even when you're not being watched by me, there's a being watching you, a creator, who will hold you accountable and he knows what's best for you and knows that in the future what you're seeing and hurting your heart and your mind with is going to affect you um, uh, in your future and what things you like and dislike and how you treat your families because when boys see, see violence and sexual violence they don't turn out to be the best husbands or fathers um, and so I think balancing that and teaching kids that even at a young age, I've always made my children apologize to God and then me if they disobey, um, because I want them to fear him more than me because I'm not always around. So it's a very important, you know, way of, of doing things for, for Muslims. For sure. Okay. So the last question is, uh, we will have societal wide problems if the issue with kids continue or will we have well, I guess he didn't really put it in a question, but he says, will we have societal wide problems if this issue with kids continues? It just seems potentially dangerous for the entire population if children are raised like this. So, um, well, without a doubt, um, uh, what do you think? Of kids that? need to learn self-control, self-discipline and honesty. Uh, and they are not learning that in American culture. On the contrary, they're learning that what's really important is to be famous and wealthy. Uh, and so we're seeing um, girls, uh, an astonishing proportion of young women in this country, more than 40% now meet criteria for anxiety or depression. Um, and uh, boys are at much lower risk for anxiety and depression, but a large and growing proportion of young men are spending their free times playing video games. Uh, when the new uh, Call of Duty comes out in November, employers say that a third of the young men call out sick so that they can spend 20 hours playing the new Call of Duty. Uh, so we've got a uh, generation of young people uh, Whereas 50 years ago, we would have had young men and young women marrying and starting a family. We now have a collapse in the marriage rate among individuals born in the United States with uh, young men spending their free time playing video games and looking at pornography and young women uh, uh, posting on social media how difficult it is to find a good man because there are not enough good men to go around. Uh, and a collapsing birth rate among Americans born and raised in the United States. The birth rate overall for the United States doesn't look so bad because immigrants uh, keep the numbers up. Um, if we didn't have immigration, we'd be in serious trouble as a country. So indeed, when you look at the big picture, it's pretty grim. The good news is that you and I don't have to look at the big picture. We are not politicians. Uh, we have to think about what's best for our family. And the good news is that we can make those changes in our family. We can turn off the bad TV. We can prioritize fun times together as a family, doing things together as a family. It doesn't cost anything to get rid of the TV. So there's only one TV in your house and to go hiking as a family uh, in the park. And that's exactly the kind of things we need to do more of. So the good news is that the intervention doesn't cost much. Um, it does require courage. It does uh, require parents who are willing to do things differently than your neighbors, but it's doable. And again, in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, I share stories of families I've known well who've done this. Um, 
and are having good outcomes. You don't have to move to uh, Northern Scotland or Appenzell, Switzerland, or uh, Dunedain, uh, Dunedin, um, Dunedin, excuse me, Dunedin uh, on the South Island. We've been reading The Lord of the Rings, so my Dunedain is mixing up with my Dunedin, but the town I'm thinking of is Dunedin on the South Island of Australia that's doing very well. But you don't have to move there. You can have good outcomes here if you can find the courage to do to do the right thing. Do you feel that things will hit rock bottom in society before they start getting better? Or do you see there's going to be a, uh, you know, a, a time when people start to realize what they've done is is not good and they're going to turn around and try to go back to the old days, kind of like how fashion recycle itself, like the 80s are back, the 90s are back. Does yeah. society so recycle itself? I, I, don't, I don't make any attempt to predict the future. I'm old enough to remember uh, in 1988 when we all believed that the Soviet Union would go on forever. We saw no way. And all the experts believe that, too. Yeah. Uh, the experts in 1988, none of them predicted the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. None of them predicted what happened in November 1989 when the wall came down. Uh, humans are unpredictable and you never know what's going to happen next. Will things keep getting worse um, not forever. Eventually things will change. Um, but you know, the Soviet union was a terrible place and it lasted, uh, for 70 years, um, for more than 70 years from 1918 to past 1990. Um, so, uh, and it was founded on lies on, on, uh, a godless idea of human nature. And it lasted over 70 years. Uh, right now, we're facing some really terrible things in the United States. Uh, we have a culture that is immensely toxic to children. Uh, such a culture cannot long endure. Uh, birth rates are collapsing. Um, it will change eventually. When that will happen, I cannot predict. What will replace it? I don't know. Um, every culture has its challenges. There are no good old days. Uh, as I said earlier, the culture of the of the 1950s was racist, sexist, and xenophobic. We don't want to go back to that. Uh, although I do think we can learn from them. They had uh, stronger families than we had, and kids respected their parents. And we have to figure out a way to have a culture where kids respect their parents, where family time is prioritized, without being racist, sexist, or xenophobic. I think it can be done, um, but we're not doing it right now. What we've got right now is a very toxic culture. Yeah, and I think that uh, Muslim parents need to either get their kids along with other Muslim children who are like-minded or even non-Muslim children who are like-minded versus trying to find people just to hang out with their kids. I mean, I always raise my children by finding them appropriate friends. I think it's a parent's job to find appropriate friends for their kids, um, not to expect them to just seek out people. Um, it, it's very important who their friends are. In Arabic, we say a sahib sahib, which means your friends will will like kind of pull you along to whatever they're doing. So whatever your friends are doing, you're going to be doing. And if you want to well, know of a man know the character of his friends and you'll know who, who he is yeah and that's another reason why i i always emphasize the choice of school is so important because that influences who your kids friends will be and who your kids friends will be you know a lot of parents say well you know i expect my kid to stand up and do the right thing that's asking an awful lot if they're at a school where all the kids are on instagram and all the kids are on TikTok and all the girls are sharing sexy selfies and all the boys are playing call of duty it's really hard to ask your kid to be the odd kid out it's not fair find a different school yeah I think from zero to 12 is the most critical age of raising children and it really develops their personality and putting them in a toxic environment isn't going to help. They're spending eight days, eight hours a day away from you with someone who's a teacher yeah. who does not have your values. And that is certainly true. But at 13 to 18 is where they're really going to face the temptations regarding sex and drugs and alcohol and cigarettes. So kids need a healthy environment, wow. uh, K through 12. Yes, but the early stages are just as important as yes. the 
important. They're all important. Yeah. They're all important in different ways, for sure. I recommend our Islamic school to the community. I've had all four of my children go through it. My oldest child, she's married now. She has a successful life. She went through the Islamic school in its heydays when it wasn't as great as it is today. We are lucky to have a great principal and great teachers who love our children and teach them um, the values of Islam along with the technology and the intellectual um, you know, it, it, the, the important intellectual ideas that are taught in, in the most highly recommended private schools throughout the nation. So I hope that more parents will join and hopefully your children will be. Is it a K through 12 school? Yes, it is. It's actually daycare through 12. So Great. You know, we start out real young and we've even had non-Muslims so sign up for our preschool in daycare because it's in such a great area and for such a great price and it's clean and the environment's very nice. Well, and I also have visited some very strong Catholic schools that enroll a lot of Muslims yeah. because again, um, all the Abrahamic religions teach mm -hmm. that God tells us what is right and wrong, that you don't get to decide for yourself. No relative uh, morality. Uh, and, and if there is not a strong Muslim school in the neighborhood, but there is a strong Catholic school, then you'll find many Muslim kids at that school. Um, many of our students that are older who have already, they're probably in their 30s, they did go to Catholic schools here locally in St. Louis. I think our own imam went to a Catholic school. Um, and uh, I know my mom went to a Catholic school. A lot of, a lot of Muslim children did, did attend Catholic schools when they weren't available. Yeah. Well, there are a great many in St. Louis, which uh, has a strong yeah. tradition of uh, actually of boys Catholic schools and girls Catholic schools, some, several of which I've spoken at. Um, I think MICDS used to be Catholic, but now they're more like a secular school. Well, MICDS used to be two different schools, the Mary Institute, which was a girls Catholic school, yeah. and the Country Day School, which was a boys school. And then they merged to become MICDS. Yeah, it's, um, it's quite a, we have quite a bit of schools here in St. Louis. Yeah. We have one of the only, there's another Muslim school, but it's much smaller. But we were one of the only Muslim schools with, you know, uh, the preschool through 12th grade and full-time gym. And um, it's adjacent to a beautiful mosque. And we have a library where I'm seated here. So uh, we are quite an active community. It's just not as active right now because of the pandemic. But sure. we'd love to have you back here, maybe in person. Maybe you can talk about why gender matters next time. Yeah, that's that's my favorite that that's a, a gr this talk today was pretty grim uh without many laughs uh the why gender matters talks though is full of laughs because it turns out that for example girls and boys men and women differ so profoundly in their ability to, to smell yeah. not 50 percent, not 100 percent, but for some orders it's a, a factor of a hundred thousand meaning yeah, a woman has a sense of smell a hundred thousand times more sensitive than the man and so man and woman go into the same room and the woman says, oh, my goodness, something died. At, I'm going to throw up. And the man says, I don't smell anything. And they don't realize they're experiencing different worlds. Um, so it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's also very useful for parents. And it's a topic that's being talked about a lot. And I think our parents need to really realize what's behind it, what's important, raising our children. And Islam itself talks about gender so much in the Quran. It's all female, male, women, men, boys, girls, constantly. Well, and speaking of confusion, this is a topic where Americans and American culture is now so confused. California now has an official state curriculum where kids in public schools are now taught that gender is something you invent and that uh, you may have the anatomy of a boy, but if you feel that you're a girl, then you're a girl. This is psychotic. Uh, this is utterly detached from reality. Uh, and it's immensely harmful, not just to that individual, but to, the, but to every kid uh, that is being taught this. Uh, it's not factual, it's lies, it's not true. Uh, and yet the people who are pushing this don't even know, don't know about these sex differences in hearing, vision, smell, language, and brain development. Uh, that's really robust and, and not even controversial among scholars, but utterly unknown in the mainstream. So it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting topic.
We have to really be careful what our kids are watching on TV, on Nickelodeon, Disney, yeah. TV, all channels that our kids, when you were young, watching them was like no problem. But now yeah. introducing ideas. They, they are often spreading these false concepts um, about gender. They can, can really look if a, if a girl thinks she can be a boy by changing her name and telling people she's a boy, a lot of bad things happen and a lot of confusion develops um, and things that should not be. And the, the, the irony, as I stress in, in my book, Why Gender Matters and in this talk, the end result of all of this uh, propaganda, ironically, has been a hardening of gender stereotypes mm -hmm. so that my daughter actually wants to go to the United States Air Force Academy following in her cousin's footsteps. She wants to fly jets for the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. And you will now find people who say, oh, your daughter wants to be an Air Force pilot. Is she going to transition to the male role? Uh, that's the irony is that this confusion has led to a hardening of gender roles. And yeah. a girl who wants to be an Air Force pilot, people now thinks, oh, she must be a boy. And a boy who wants to, to do ballet, oh, he must be a girl. If you're not a girl who loves pink and plays with Barbies, are you transitioning to the male role? If you're not a boy who loves to whack people and play football, maybe you should change your name to Emily. That's the weird uh, end result of this uh, gender confusion is a hardening of gender stereotypes. Yeah, I, I do think it's more involved than just what you've said because this is a whole topic on itself. Yes. But um, hopefully we'll bring you back for that. And our community needs a lot of education in this, as do all the communities. And I've been advertising you to all the schools I go to and lectures as well. Well, thank you. Because um, in Islam, it's not just about you and your family. The whole community needs to be uplifted and taught and if you have a healthy community, then your child will be healthy as well. So it's really important to us that we help everyone's children, Muslim or non-Muslim. Yeah. Um, it's five o'clock. So if there's any more questions, um, I would love to take them. Anybody else wants to ask a question, they're welcome to go online and post it. The talk was originally till five. Is there any final things you want to say, Dr. Sachs, that will really change our lives <laughs> <laughs> well i've again i've uh got my uh email address uh i uh send out a newsletter i haven't sent out one in a couple months but i'll be sending out one soon about an article i wrote for the institute for family studies on the immigrant paradox so okay. if you go to my website leonardsex.com and sign up sign up for the newsletter when i write something that i think is worth uh sharing uh i post that no more than once a month uh, and uh, if I return to St. Louis and you're on the newsletter, you'll know about that. So I hope you'll consider uh, going to the website and signing up for the newsletter. And you're always welcome to send me an email. Um, if you haven't heard from me in a couple of days, uh, <laughs> send another. But uh, I'm usually, I usually can get back to emails uh, within three, four days. Sometimes it takes a week, but I try to answer e every email I get. Uh, and your books are available on Amazon for now. Hopefully they won't get canceled. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> so um, if it comes to those books, the shipping's free. Just go to Amazon. We'll have some copies in the library for borrowing if you want to borrow them. But hopefully you'll get your own book and you'll read it over and over again. Um, and the website I posted, also those papers that you had originally spoken about, the what were they called? Um, the handouts. Yes. The the link is leonardsachs.com slash parenting.pdf. Uh, all lowercase, and you must include the www and the .pdf. That is a 16-page handout with all the main points from this talk, as well as citations to all the research that I cited. Okay. I'll, I'll have all these links posted on our Facebook once I get our IT guy to do it. That way they can just click on Facebook and find it. But um, great. it's been a great event. Everybody's really happy. We had a pretty good turnout. People do watch a lot of these videos later on because they're recorded and they're put on our website. So we'll have a lot more people watching them later. Today is a really nice day in St. Louis. So a lot of people were out in the park and you sure. know doing things with their family. Springtime. So, yeah, it's a beautiful day in St. Louis. But Very we thank good. you so much and we look forward to hearing you again. And I hope that you and your family are safe and healthy and in God's uh, protection at all times. Thank you and likewise.
Okay, I'm going to so sign much. off. Okay, thank you so much for attending. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bye-bye.